tonight's regular session to order. Uh, let's go ahead and start with roll call, please. Mayor Bagley. Of course, here. Uh, here, I am here. <laughs> Councilmember Christensen. Here. Councilmember Hidalgo Faring. Here. Councilmember Martin. Here. Councilmember Peck. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, great. Let's start with the pledge. Um, what lucky soul this evening. Marsha, you looked up. You rolled your eyes. Yeah, you're gonna you go ahead. Everybody's and everybody has to turn their mute off. Okay. So we all we all sound equally ridiculous. Here we go. All right, go ahead. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to, and the, to Republic, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. We're getting used to reading mouths now, though. Yeah. Thanks, Marsha. All right. A uh, quick reminder to the public. Um, anyone wishing to provide public comment during the public invited to be heard, you've got to go and do this. Dial that number, enter the meeting ID and then uh, press pound, and then you will be admitted to the room uh, according to the last four numbers of your, or four digits of your phone number. Um, so uh, uh, listen to the live stream and we'll call on you um, according to who comes in first. All right, can I have my agenda back? Okay, um, next, approval of minutes. Can we have a motion to approve the November 10th, 2020 regular session minutes, please? So moved. So moved. Second. All right, moved by Councilmember Christensen and seconded by Councilmember Waters. All in favor of approval of the November 10th, 2020 minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, uh, the motion carries. Um, can we have a motion to pass the regular session minutes of November 17th, 2020? So moved. I'll second that. It was moved by Dr. Waters, seconded by myself. All in favor of the approval of the November 17th, 2020 regular session minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, that motion carries unanimously. Let's go on to agenda revisions and submission of documents and motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas. Um, before we talk about the Weld County issue, is there anything else? Mayor, I just wanted to note that staff has pulled items 9I Okay. And 12D, both are the Longmont Housing Authority items. Those will be brought back later. And okay. Harold just wanted to tell you why. All right. Mayor, Council, yesterday um, we had some conversations with um, uh, Jim and our financial group. And based on what we learned is if we brought it in at this point in December, even if even that it was only one month, it would have meant that we would have had to bring all of their financials into our CAFR next year. Um, and so in order to keep things aligned, we want to bring that on on July 5th um, and, and turn that study session into a regular session for this conversation so that then what that means for us, the financials come onto the CAFR in 2022, not 2021, which would create an insane amount of work to bring that in now. Is that correct, Jim? Uh, yeah, I, I just want to correct. You said July 5th. Yeah. You meant January. January 5th. Sorry, January and, 5th. And by bringing them in now, we'd bring them into the 2020 CAFR, and we're just not prepared to be able to take that on. It's a very big impact, and we really don't have enough uh, experience with their financials to feel uh, confident to bring those in this year. Councilmember Martin, your hand was up. Oh, I was going to point out the July versus January yeah. thing, too. Okay. All right. Dr. Waters? Uh, I guess this would be to Jim. Should we assume then that as an LHA, now put my LHA up back on, that LHA would uh, probably work at it through you, but would we would arrange for an audit of, of um, financials for LHA independently of the city and contract that service? That's correct. <laughs> just, just as in the past, but we would be working with it. And then, the, then ultimately, the council would be have a chance to review those the results of that audit. Sure. All right. Thanks. The council will be the board and review the audit, yeah. but it won't be incorporated into our CAFR as Thanks. a ancillary organization. Is what I call it. What's the technical term, Jim? A uh, component unit. A component unit. 
Okay, great. Anything else other than the Weld, Co Weld County issue? All right, so I, I, the reason I wanted to move this from the bottom of the agenda up to here, um, I want to uh, explain what the hell happened. Uh, so my council members are kind of up to speed. And then I also, first and foremost, I wanted to take action to put something on the agenda so we could discuss what's happening, okay? So first and foremost, um, it's no secret that when I was first told that we'd be shutting down, right? Shutting small businesses, restaurants back in March, uh, I took that news unwell, let's put it that way. Um, for the last nine months, we have been dealing with a situation where we have constantly been living for all kinds of reasons, but right now let's deal with the pandemic in a state of anxiety, fear, and uh, threat of all kinds of things pertaining to the virus. Um, I have been an, a vocal proponent of not shutting down. I have been a vocal advocate of keeping our small, small businesses open. Um, uh, I, like other small business owners, March, April, May, and June, lost, came close to running out of business. Had it not been for the PPP loan from the government, I wouldn't have made it. Um, other small business owners are in that similar situation. Currently, the reason why I and others are stressing out is because there's no more powder left. The phrase, keep your powder dry, there's no powder. It's dry. If we go on shutdown again, uh, I and others are, are worried. And I understand the sentiment of people who own small business saying, I'm not shutting down again, or restaurants wanting to stay open. I get that. As a result of what happened, national news, media, I canceled my cable subscription in April. I have not been watching the national news. I have getting, I'm getting all my information from two sources, actually three sources, Harold, I'm getting it from the state emails and I'm getting it from the city Danny Men's updates. So the county, state, and, and, and the city is where I'm getting my COVID information from. And I saw a change. The problem is the government shut us down and I believe that it was unnecessary before, premature, which made us all tired, sick of COVID and put us in a situation where we can't do it again. But the difference is now, I'm seeing 31 hospitals are currently full in the state of Colorado. I'm seeing that Weld County had 78 ICU beds, 76 were full. And I was seeing that Longmont's hospitals, we, we had 10 ICU beds left, seven in Longmont. And what I was seeing in these emails and in these briefings was that it, it suddenly dawned on me that, oh my gosh, I agree. Most of us won't die of COVID you know, a very small percentage of us. Our elderly are exposed. Five and a half percent are looking at dying. So you have the left arguing number of cases. You have the right arguing deaths. But the reality is if all the elderly who get COVID and need an ICU bed go and seek help, what are we gonna do if we have a car accident? What are we gonna do if we have sepsis? What are we gonna do if we have a heart attack? So we don't have enough ICU beds. If you talk, I talk to the CEOs of UC Health and LUH, they've got another problem. That is, as we're building beds and people are building facilities, it's not gonna do us any good because we don't have trained nurses and doctors available in order to treat people in ICU, COVID and otherwise. So now all of a sudden we go into the holiday seasons and I, I don't know about you guys, but I used to, y'all, how many people do you know have had COVID? How many people have had COVID? It's a, I don't know anybody who has COVID. I know a lot of people who've had COVID. I've had a person in my Lakewood office, two people in my Longmont office, my daughter, my son-in-law, uh, my brother, his kid. I mean, everybody's getting COVID, which means that percentage of people who need an ICU bed is increasing. And so 23 mayors, I didn't sign the letter. They did not even ask me to sign it because they just assumed that Bagley wouldn't be on board. But 23 mayors of the Metro Mayor's Caucus sent a letter to the governor saying, please, please put pressure on, on counties like Weld County so that they will comply with the state mandated emergency health orders. Like it or not, the state legislature handed that authority off to the governor. From day one, I and this council have said, we will back the governor we will comply with orders, whether we like it or not. So this last round, he said, restaurants are gonna close, only curbside pickup and carry out. Whether I like that or not is irrelevant. 
There are he county health directors and there are state orders for a reason. They have information that we don't, whether we like it or not, whether you voted for Governor Polis or not, he is the man in charge right now trying to get us through this pandemic. 23 mayors sent a letter saying, please comply Weld County. Their response was, no, we will not do, we will not enforce any restriction pertaining to businesses, lockdowns, uh, limiting gatherings, nothing. So Mayor Bagley being Mayor Bagley, basically simply proposed a point or, a, or I proposed an ordinance, but was really making a point. If it comes down to it, I never said, let's don't give Weld County and other counties that don't comply health care. What I said is, if we face a situation where there is a bed or there is a hospital room or a situation where we cannot get the resources and there are two people needing access to one doctor or one ICU bed, and you have one person who comes from a jurisdiction that complies and another one that does not, it would only be fair to say, hey, if you're complying, you get access to the bed. I never said we're going to cut it off from Weld County. I was proving a point that you're either part of the solution or you are the problem. That was it. And so now I then walked it back because I don't, I was getting calls from elderly people saying, why are you going to take away my health care? Nobody is proposing that. That was never my point. But my point still stands and my concern still stands. And that is we have neighbors to the east who are, by their words, are encouraging their citizens and the residents of Weld County to not comply with the governor's health and safety orders. What that means is their hospitals get full, they come to us. And where I got mad was they had two beds, but they reported having 43. And those 43 beds were located in Boulder, Broomfield, Larimer and Adams. They have two hospitals, but they were counting another 12 to say, we've got 14 in Weld County. And I thought that is wholly unfair, completely unfair. So I put it on the agenda, the media caught wind of it, and you observed what happened. So those of you listening on Public Invited to be heard, I'm sorry you're scared. I'm sorry you're angry. I'm sorry. I'm sure many of you are going to say, it's not human of me. Scarcity, I'm sure most of the people who are angry at me are Republicans and conservative. Let me say that I also speak that language. I'm a capitalist. Scarcity is a resource. If you have one bed, one bed only, two people who need it, the question becomes, what criteria would you impose to make sure that the right person got that bed? Now, we're not going to do it at a local level. We're going to leave that up to the, the, the state's hospital association. But I do think that there are some things that we need to do and say to our neighbors to the east. Joan, I believe you had an idea that I am willing to support. Would you like to have the floor at this point? Yes, thank you, Mayor Bagley. And um, I don't think I need to say any more except for that I understood what you were trying to do and the premise of what you were trying to do. So uh, I am going to make a motion. I sent all of council a resolution that I am going to uh, read um, and then we'll vote on and discuss if you want to do it or if you do not. So it is a resolution in support of the governor's temporary restrictions on COVID-19. So I move that we accept this resolution, which I will read. It says, whereas our nation and the state of Colorado are experiencing a coronavirus epidemic, whereas the governor of Colorado, Jared Polis, has issued statewide temporary restrictions to minimize the risk and spread of the virus, Whereas the elected officials of several counties, including our neighbor, Weld County, refused to follow the temporary restrictions. Whereas Weld County's refusal to follow the governor's restrictions is impacting the risk and health of Longmont and surrounding cities. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Longmont City Council directs staff to craft a letter to the Weld County commissioners Number one, demanding that Weld County follow the governor's temporary restrictions and make a public statement to residents encourage wearing masks, social distancing and hand washing and consider erecting medical tents to add more beds and to care for the county's overflow ICU patients as other cities are doing. Longmont City Council further directs staff to reach out to other cities in our health impact region to sign the letter and send the letter to Governor Polis 
suggesting that state funding be withheld from all counties not complying with the state's temporary restrictions. So do I have a second on that one? I'm sure you, you have, you might have a few, but I'm gonna let somebody else do it. Councilmember Christensen? I'll second it. All right, it's been uh, the, the motion to approve the resolution. Again, the resolution is quirky. This is just to put it on the agenda. The resolution was to direct staff. So it's not a resolution declaring anything. It's just Joan resolution small r saying, we're gonna direct staff in a very public important way to please prepare something for our next meeting. So, and it was seconded by council member Christensen. All right, let's open this matter for debate. Anybody? Uh, let's go with, uh, let's go with uh, council member Waters, then council member Martin, then council member Christensen. Um, so do you, uh, do you or council member Peck want any feedback on the substance of this? I, um, because I if, if it comes back the way it's worded now, I'm going to have concerns about it. I, 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 I just like, for example, my concern is I, I wouldn't necessarily tell people to set up tents if we don't have staff, but I think for, for tonight, I mean, I mean, it's, it, we're, we're directing staff to bring something back, but what, what would you, what would your concern be, Dr. Water? That would be one. Uh, the, I, I, I mean, I just have questions about when field hospitals are created, do, do cities do that or do healthcare providers and do you have the staff, et cetera? And what are the liabilities if we do it versus the, 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 the our medical providers? That would be one. The other is, it's my understanding that the legislation that's going to the governor already contains a clause or provision that would um, would restrict uh, the allocation of funding or the award of funding. And it's going to be on an application basis. But the counties that don't comply with the governor's orders, that, that's in the legislation. It's on its way to the governor's desk now. So that would be, you know, whether I don't think we need that. That's that's the point. But th those would be the only two points. I agree in concept. I, I appreciate the effort. Um, and I'd like to be, I'd like to have a, re, a, a resolution I could vote yes on. Um, those would be my two concerns. Can I address that, Mayor Beth? Sure. Of course you can, John. Go ahead. So, Councilman Waters, would it be uh, um, maybe a suggestion to amend this to say that we support the legislation going to, uh, that is going to be voted on um, to whatever your wording was? Yeah, I think that would be a, a. I think that would be spot on, actually, because okay, so that is what the, what, what's going to. Yeah. Okay, so you, that's an amendment you're making. I would, I'll, if you if you'll accept that in, that amendment, I'll make that amendment. Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. Harold. On that piece, and I was going to touch on this in my COVID update in terms of supporting the governor on that legislation in that piece. Could you all make the motion where we can draft uh, a letter for you all to sign and get out? Um, quickly because it's only a three-day legislative session. So if you can adjust that so we can well, write a letter declaring your support so we can get that to you and get it to the governor. We'll, let, 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 we'll do that as soon as we wrap up on this one. But actually, let's do that now. Is, we have consensus on that. Do we not, guys? All right. Yeah, well, let's just, like, can we deal with this? Yeah, we'll, we deal with this? this? We'll, deal with th we'll deal with this one. We'll deal with this one, and then we'll come back. Yeah. That's good. Uh, Marsha, are you, were you done, Doc? Well, only, no, well, I was... I appreciate the uh, council member Peck accepting the amendment. I, I don't know what to make of the, of the tents. I get the point. I just think I, I, if, we, if, if it was to support, if the city's, this council supporting whatever our providers would need to do to deploy resources to accommodate overflow, something like that, as, as specific as constructing tents. But I, I just, I'd just be happy if the Weld County Commissioners stopped making statements such as, we're going to embrace our freedoms and constitutional rights while the rest of you cower in your home and Netflix and chill. I, I'd be happy with just some, I mean, I thought I was the king of stupid public statements. All right, Councilmember Martian, Martin? <laughs> um, I was just going to suggest, I don't know whether it's still true or not, um, but uh, there was a chance that the legislature was going to wrap up tomorrow. Um, it might be better to have the um, the staff draft a letter of support to whatever um, uh, consequences the legislature puts into place, and then um, have the letter sent as as a, a an open letter to 
all the commissioners. Well, let's, well, well let's 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 deal with the letter after we're done with Jones. Let's do, okay. let's deal with the letter after we 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 tackle uh, Jones' uh, direction and resolution to the staff. Sure. Okay, then, is that all right? Then we'll come back, Marcia. Yeah, yeah. The just just then to say let's let's just put a little. Um, a little flexibility into the into the staff's direction so that based on what the legislature does, they can react to that. Okay, all right, Councilmember Christensen. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor. I, um, I am in support of this. I think this is the right way to do it. I think so we need to have two letters, one in support of the governor's um, initiative and another uh, seeking the support of Fort Collins and Loveland uh, to react against this. I, I, as I told you on the phone, Brian, when I talked to you, I, I quite, I completely agree that their behavior is irresponsible. It's going to cause death, and it's, you know, flouting the law. Is it's ridiculous. It is totally just political ideology and posturing and it's going to cost people their lives um i we're all incredibly frustrated at the i've i've run a small business uh, you know half of us have and it's extremely painful to see what's happening to everybody around here but the businesses are it's heartbreaking because some of them will never come back They've put everything they had into their business and, you know, we're all feeling very helpless about it. It's extremely frustrating. Um, I am particularly disgusted with the Weld County Commissioner's statement that uh, Longmont City Council is attacking the working class, who are the ones um, that are suffering from the shutdown. They're suffering because of people like the Weld County Commissioners who encourage people not to uh, follow protocol. And that's why we have this skyrocketing amount of COVID out here. The, the working class has definitely suffered the most. They always do, and the, and the poor. We have a 40% uh, rate of COVID among the Latinos in Boulder County, and they're only 13.8% of the county that is Latino. So that's, that's outrageous. That's because they are frontline workers and essential workers. When the Weld County commissioners accuse us of attacking the working class, that is disgusting to me because that is exactly what we're trying to protect is everybody. If everybody follows the protocol, we will slowly, slowly bring this back down again. Um, I wanted to uh, clarify something because um, Oh, I thought that the um, um, comment in this, or the idea of erecting tents in this uh, resolution had to do with Weld County erecting tents. If they don't have enough uh, ICUs there, then they should pay for erecting tents in Weld County to make up for the fact that they don't have enough ICU units. Is that not true? Because well, well, right now, so right now, the governor issued a uh, the governor issued an order where he took uh, took authority regulating what patients go to what hospitals when they get full. Right. As right. a backup measure to the hospital association of the state, um, they're they're running everything. So yes, um, but you know, I, so but Weld County should be augmenting their hospitals with tents. Not if, if if I, I mean I would argue if if the governor says that that's necessary I would say yes you know yeah. but okay. uh, but I don't think I don't know if the, the the governor has has done that yet so okay that's that's a confusing but I I am for this and I I think that I'm glad we're having this discussion I really don't like the way you did this Mayor Bagley but I am glad as I told you we need to have this discussion and we're having it now and that's a good thing. And um, this is the way to do it is in public in, with all of council. But um, I, I really hope we can get Loveland and Fort Collins to join 
onto this and say, you know, we're all, we're all acting like neighbors. We're all acting like good neighbors and you need to too. You don't get to come over to my yard and trash it, you know. We're, we don't, we would not deny medical care to anybody. It's illegal and it's immoral, but it is wrong for people to expect us to bear the burden of what they've been irresponsible enough to let loose. And so I, I uh, applaud the mayor and Councilwoman Peck for um, bringing this forth. And um, I hope we can get those letters out pretty quick. So, thank, thank you, you Councilmember. And one, one other point that just comes to mind is that our rest, so we can't open our restaurants until our, our numbers go down. And if a neighbor is bringing mud into the house, taking our shoes off is not gonna make a difference, so to speak. And so what we're really doing is asking the neighbor, please don't blare your radio. Don't flick your cigarette buds onto our lawn. Just, just help us, please. Uh, Council member Hidalgo Faring. So I do have a question about, and I am in support of this resolution. Um, yeah, so I, I, it's nothing in regard to this, but I think it's really important that the public know Boulder County is, if I read, when I looked at the slide, 6.7% positivity rate, correct, Harold? You're on mute. Yes, and I can go over. Okay, and I just wanted to put it in context with yeah, this. Yeah, it's called Weld a drum roll. County, Weld County's positivity rate. What is theirs? Uh, you want me to just share my screen on this part? You can. Yeah. I know it was like 16 something, but I don't, I, I didn't want to give a miscalculated number. So I'm going to, this is the COVID dial and you'll see some of this again. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Longmont 757, it's actually down. Six point, this says 6.9, but on the updated slides from the county, we're at 6.7. And then okay. we're at eight days declining. But, but what's what she really yeah. is asking, she wants you to compare to Weld County. I am. I'm going to Weld yeah. County now. So, oh, shoot. Yeah, I've seen. Now we I are. didn't see it. All right. So let me do this again. So this is Boulder County, 757. Here it says 6.9. The updated number we have from the county that I'll show, I believe, 6.7. And eight days declining stable hospitalizations. Two week cumulative incidents, 1,169, average positivity 15.4, and six days of declining stable hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. So right around, the, right, right around the time that this hit the news. Mm -hmm. So, and they're in red in all three categories. Correct. That's another thing to put into perspective of why neighboring counties, we, why we are so frustrated. And it's, it isn't fair to put this on our own business owners. And it's not fair to their own residents who are trying to do the right thing, who are trying to be healthy. But they are prolonging this whole issue with the pushing back. They're the reason why I can't be in classroom in front of my kids and that I'm in screens with watching all my 20 kids online. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm done with that. Everybody needs to be a good neighbor. We, we are in this together. So I keep going back to, you know, the World War II effort. You know, do your part for Uncle Sam, do your part for America. Okay, we're in a situation like that. And the pushback, you know, that we're against working, working class. I'm working class. <laughs> we are, many of us here are working class. We, that's not the issue. That's not the issue. We're trying to do the right thing to suppress the spread so we can open up, so we can be in front of our classroom with our kids. And, you know, I hear some of the pushback that I was heard, well, masks don't work. Well, masks work with hand washing and social distancing. There are many facets that need to be in place in order for this to work. It's not just one or the other. And we need everybody to do their part. That's all I'm going to say. Sorry. It's been a long day. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, council member. All right. So we've got a motion on the table and that motion is directing staff to prepare a resolution um, asking, I'm, I'm summarizing here, 
asking the uh, uh, asking staff to reach out and admonish. Um, I believe the word was demand that our neighbor in Weld County, the commissioners, uh, encourage themselves comply and encourage their residents to comply with the governor's emergency orders pertaining to COVID. Uh, reach out to our fellow uh, neighbors and get them to sign on to the letter, as well as draft a letter to the governor asking that, uh, encouraging him to withhold state funding from those counties, such as Weld County, that do not comply with his emergency orders. Councilmember Peck. Um, thank you, Mayor Badley. Uh, that last part that you just read, remember that uh, Councilman Waters made a friendly amendment to this, that we were going to support the legislation. Uh, yes, okay. A, a letter sub supporting what the legislation that's going to the governor, encouraging that the state withhold funding from Weld County and other counties that fail to comply with the governor's uh, emergency orders pertaining to COVID. Correct. So all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, that motion passes, uh, carries unanimously. Thank you guys. Yes, Councilmember Martin. Um, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, I just want to uh, call on the people of Longmont. First of all, as our numbers are improving, uh, I can say that I think we are doing well, in, you know, getting back on track with our compliance, but we need to put our money where our mouth is, which means putting up with getting carry out from our local businesses and don't cross that line so you can eat inside a restaurant, please. Just please, don't uh, do it. I was actually invited to Weld County to go to dinner. I'm like, you kidding me? <laughs> Hell no. All right. Uh, do we need to, uh, Council Member Christensen, They might have you for dinner. I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. The other thing is all the people. So we're about ready to get yelled at. Um, we're about ready to go into first call public invited to be heard. Actually, we don't. Let's go ahead and do this COVID update and then a special report. And then I'll, I'll, I'll just going to, I'm going to say it again. Everyone needs to direct their comments to the chair. Good news. Most people are going to be mad at me and I am the chair. So it'll be great. But let's go ahead and uh, city manager report, please. Um, Mayor Council, actually today we have a fairly um, extensive report to you all uh, based on everything that we've been going over with the county, the numbers, um, and I'm, I'm going to touch on hospital issues and then Sandy's going to update on the legislative stuff. Some of the things have passed and so Sandy's going to jump in and tell you what's happened recently. Uh, the first thing I want to say is um, there's been a lot of activity and part of it is there have been changes. Uh, um, at the CDC level, CDPHE in terms of how we manage exposures and what we deal with. And so it's really created a lot of conversations with the county. So um, we're in the middle of really readjusting some things based on what happens when someone's positive, how we go through the chase tracing process internally, and then what does that mean to us in terms of our ongoing operation. Um, at one point, we thought there were going to be some really significant issues in terms of continuing operations based on that, but we've had some really productive conversations with the, council, the county today. I want to thank them for the work they've done and uh, their, their teamwork that we used in this. So we think we really have a path forward, path forward to ensure that we can continue our most critical operations. That being said, there are some things within the new guidelines from the state and from the CDC that may mean certain operations that are not critical if we have certain exposures um, may have to shut down for a little bit based on the new guidance in terms of how far, how long we have to potentially quarantine someone, but there's a way to deal with that. And it's kind of what you all were talking about. And it's pretty simple for us and we're gonna be reinforcing this within our organization. Um, it is wear mask, but now masking is not the big piece actually socially distancing and making sure that you're at least six feet from someone and you don't have that continuous exposure for 15 minutes with the same individual over a 24-hour period of time. Those are key components that they're now bringing into that evaluation um, and determining whether or not you need to isolate for um, 14 days. Um, and so we're working through a lot of this because it's a new change. We don't know everything. But just wanted to let you know, if you hear us having to make some adjustments 
the non-critical operations, it is because of the new guidance that's moving through um, and coming down. I'm gonna share my screen now. Can you all see the little COVID piece, the little ball? So um, today I'm doing the presentation. Jeff is going to be able to join us next week. Um, he and I have been talking about the numbers and we've been going over it. So he's provided me with their presentation. Um, and then I also have a slide that he wanted me to present to you all. Um, when we look at this, this is what we started off with. And so when you look at the cumulative incident rate, you can see all of the counties in red. I think the important piece on this is that last week, um, Boulder County was at 891.9. So we are down um, about 140 on, on this two week cumulative incident or incidence rate. And then when you look at the two week testing positivity rate, you can see that we're at 6.7%. This is the number that council member the dog of Farian was referring to earlier, but you can see that, um, you know, counties are all over the place in terms of their incidence rate and to the point you were making, um, when you look along the front range, um, you know, Boulder is, you know, in this rate performing better. You can see these other counties in orange, but you can definitely see the counties that are in red um, that you all were talking about um, earlier. And then when you look at the hospitalization status, you can see um, eight to 11 days. This has obviously changed since this has changed on the website versus the slide that I got earlier today. So you can see how they're updating that real time in this. So I would refer to the website on this one. That's where the biggest difference is. When we look at the numbers and you really see what's been going on recently, um, you can see that um, we hit the high of 327 cases in one day. Um, the key piece in this is that from 1123 to 1129, um, all of our daily case counts, the complete data set was above 100 every day and we were above 150 on four days. You know, and that's a lot when you look at where we were in early October but it's still better than where we were recently in terms of when we really saw this spike. Now, when you look at this chart, this again um, is the chart that they started creating when they saw, you know, in the light blue, the cases that were associated with CU. The big piece on this one is that about 8% of the cases in the past week have been about among CU affiliated um, county residents. And so that they're continuing to watch that. Um, and then when we look at the um, number of Boulder County residents testing who are so considered probable with long-term care facility, um, there have been 113 uh, long-term care facility associated cases among Boulder County residents in the past two weeks. Um, this is one of the highest two week case counts for long-term care facilities that we've had. Um, and it's surpassed only during the height of the initial surge in uh, late April, early May. There are currently 15 confirmed active outbreaks in Boulder County long-term care facilities, and that's up from five from last week. Now, this is an, an interesting piece because I want to talk about it a, a little bit as it relates to the work that we're doing with the Housing Authority. Um, as you all know, um, a number of properties that we have at the Housing Authority have high-risk individuals in those, and so we've had to take certain actions um, based on the move to level red where we don't allow people to congregate in areas. Um, we are request, requiring the masking and some other pieces, but I also wanna let you know that it, it is based on what we're seeing in terms of compliance, there's probably gonna be more information coming out for me, essentially saying, if you don't comply with the orders, we may have to consider this a lease violation because of what we're seeing in some of our facilities. Uh, we have had in um, one facility, um, the Lodge in Hearthstone, we've had a number of individuals test positive. Tomorrow, we've been working with CDPHE where they're sending in a strike team so we can test everyone in both facilities if they choose to be tested um, because we are seeing a number of cases. It's not considered an outbreak. And this is what we've learned in the process because they are essentially apartments 
and they're not a long-term care facility where they all where individuals move in and out, it's not considered one. But it is something that we're concerned about. Boulder County Health is concerned about and CDPHE. So we're working on this to get the area tested. Unfortunately, we have had two deaths um, within the last couple of weeks. And um, so what we do is um, because of HIPAA rules, we notify individuals who have had close contact. Um, and, and then we just start working with them in terms of what we need to do to try to keep everyone safe. But we're gonna take a more aggressive approach because we're definitely seeing the same thing you're seeing here in long-term care facilities we've seen. Um, and to the point you all were making, it, it is an issue that we're concerned about. When you look at the five-day average of number of new cases, I mean, this is, who would have thought that we would have said 157 looks good, but if you can see the peak and where we are, we're definitely trending in the right direction. I think what I was hearing a lot today though, is there's really a lot of concern about what's gonna happen after the holidays. And so um, if you happen to catch the governor's um, press conference with Dr. Fauci, they talked about a surge upon a surge and how people were in, how did people congregate during the holidays and what's that gonna mean in terms of the caseload? So again, we're still really watching this. Um, and so it's at 157 cases per day. It's decreased um, where we were averaging about 202. When you look at the new case rates by county, I think it's, it's really important to see the red, which is Boulder County. Um, over the past 10 days, new case rates in all metro counties have been dropping, but um, they're still far above any time during the recent surge. Boulder, obviously the red line, is lower than all but Broomfield County in terms of new case rates per 100,000. Um, so again, to the point we were making, we're all moving in, in a better direction and we hope that we can continue this. Um, we're gonna talk about what we're seeing in the county. So since uh, the 1st of October, Longmont has had the, the highest um, case rate per 100,000 of all the municipalities. And you can see that's 2,700 versus 1,900 with Boulder. Um, again, the data for Lions, they're still working with because of PO Box, but you know, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of our community, uh, in terms of the per 100,000. We'll show you the cases. This is actually um, what it looks, this graph shows a weekly number of COVID cases um, by a select group of municipalities. Um, Boulder, 381 cases, Longmont, 458. Um, Louisville, Lafayette, Superior, 169 cases. And then the other municipalities in unincorporated Boulder County, 131 cases. In the past seven days, about 34% of the new cases have resided in the city of Boulder and 40% have resided in Longmont. So what does this mean in terms of age range? You're continuing to see um, the same uh, demographic, the same breakdown by age range, 18 to 22 still has the, the majority of cases um, as we look at this. And again, this is per 100,000, this is not actual cases. Um, so 18 to 22, then 23 to 24, 25 to 34, and 34 um, have the most. Um, we've been talking about children. And I think this is, you know, when we look at cases among zero to four and 10 to 14 year olds, that has actually remained relatively st steady or declined recently, which is um, um, compared to the previous two weeks. Um, cases did fall among the five to nine and five to 17 year olds over the time periods. Five to nine decreased by 29% and 15 to 17 decreased by 24%. So I know we were all watching that related to um, education in, in our youth, in our communities. Um, trends in case rate by age group, um, they're diverging. And case rates have decreased among zero to 44 year olds. They've remained re relatively stable among 45 to 64 year olds. They've increased by 25% among 65 to 70 year old, 74 year olds and 29% among 75 plus in the past two weeks compared to the previous two weeks. And so that, that divergence is important because as we talked about earlier and what you've heard us say, um, the likelihood of someone being hospitalized is, is higher in that uh, 65 plus age group. And, and then what we tend to see is the severity of the cases are more likely statistically 
um, in that age group. So um, it, it's, and you can see this movement here where you can see the 75 plus and then the 65, it, you can see where it's, they're both moving opposite of what we're seeing in the other age ranges. Um, 75, 76.5% uh, of the cases have a known ethnicity. Um, only race and eth ethnicity groups of three or more cases are displayed. Um, we're continuing to see persistent large disparities among our Hispanic Latinx population. In the past seven days, 43.4% of the cases or 344 have been among Hispanic, Hispanic Latinx. And 52.5% of our cases or 416 have been among white non-Hispanic. One of the things I wanted to talk about on this slide is we have been working with the county. And so last Tuesday, we actually started um, a testing site in the evenings at Lashley Street Station because we're trying to, to, have, to create a testing site at, at this point once a week, generally in the areas where we're seeing the cases develop so we can have easy access for members of our community. And we're doing it in the evening because we understand people work and being able to test during the days is, is not easy. Um, we have really hit in terms of having our, our bilingual uh, staff members and cultural brokers at this location. Um, so we have multiple people who are bilingual um, to, to help folks fill out the forms. Um, I don't know how they did today. Last week, because we didn't have a council meeting, I volunteered. It was uh, not a lot of people went in, but it was Thanksgiving week and um, everything tended to be down. I'll get a report tomorrow to see how many people went into that location. We're gonna continue evaluating it and we're gonna continue to work with our neighborhood resources group in Carmen to really see how do we continue to engage in conversations with our cultural brokers so that we, we can help individuals understand the importance of testing, but also what services we have available because that's one of the things that we heard. So the two questions that I heard the most when I was out there is one, is the testing free? And two, if we test positive, what resources are available if we're unable to go to work? So we're, we're wrapping our hands and trying to improve that communication. Um, there's, there has been a decrease in the absolute and no change in the relative disparity. In, in this population, and I think this is what you're seeing in this, in terms of the, the Latinx population. Um, we're not seeing as many cases, but the percentage and the disparity is still tending to, to trend in the same direction. Um, the five-day average percent of tests that were positive is 6.2. Um, so when you look at this, this is the five-day average, not the two-week average. So that's where you're seeing the differences in the number. Uh, at the beginning of October, we were 4.7, so we're definitely seeing this move in the right direction. Um, when you can see that in this pace, this is the number of tests that we're conducting, and this is the number of positive tests. And you can see that we're just able to perform a lot in the sense that thousands, the first benchmark, the first area here versus before you would see two, 500, 700. Um, and so we're performing a lot of tests in our community. We have the fairgrounds, we have the site at the Innovation Center, we have the site at Lashley Street that we're, that we're working, partnering with the county on. And then you can see what that rolling average looks like. And this is important. Uh, this is one of the pieces that we watch really close in terms of how we're moving in that, um, the five-day rolling average on percent positive. Um, and once again, and this is just to show the movement, really not gonna focus. Um, because there is a three-day lag between the, the time a test is conducted and when the results are reported, um, it's, we're, we're still seeing that movement and we're hoping to see that continued movement in this case. Um, again, similar piece, but what you're seeing is this movement here and here in the 65 to 74 and the 75 plus. So here's a question, hospitalizations. Um, the data, this data is cumulative over time. Um, most cases have not been hospitalized. More severe outcomes have been seen among the older age groups, which we've been talking about. This is where we sit today. And if you remember this early on, um, the staffing 
style in terms of what council member or mayor Bagley was talking about. Um, we've, we were always been in this green area here, it's moving closer to yellow. That's what we're hearing from our medical providers in terms of having staff availability. Um, adult critical care events, you can see here um, is in the yellow. Um, they're doing well, but we're definitely see the dial move and then the ICU beds is what we were talking about. Um, in terms of the hospitals, um, the number we had today, we had 120 hospitalized in Boulder County. That's actually down a little bit. Um, and we had 38 hospitalized in Longmont. So here's what the hospitalizations in Boulder County looks like. Um, and this is not just specific to Boulder County residents. Um, this is P this is individuals that are hospitalized in Boulder County. Um, and you can see that trend in terms of what we've seen recently. Um, again, the number I had when I said 120, um, this slide was presented earlier today. So obviously it's not showing that decrease. Um, and then here's a question that we're having now. Level purple is really the hospital surge metrics. And so the metric, the first metric is approaching the need for medical crisis standards of care. Um, our Boulder County hospitals are reporting that they're not approaching this. Um, utilizing alternative care sites, no. Critical shortages of PPE or staff, um, they're reporting sufficient PPE. Two of five Boulder County hospitals are reporting anticipated staff shortages and re regionally 43%, 13 of 30 um, hospitals are reporting anticipated staff shortages. Again, the conversation that we were having earlier. Um, and then hospitals approaching 90% of the reported surge capacity. Um, Boulder County, 19% of medical surgical and 17% of ICU beds available. Again, that's lower than where we've been. One of five Boulder County hospitals reporting the uh, anticipated ICU beds shortage. Um, for transfer capability, three of five hospitals report tight, tight ICU capability for COVID patients and four or five report tight ICU capability for non-COVID patients, meaning being able to transfer into the system. Um, and then 46% of regional hospitals report um, less than 10% ICU bed availability. So this is a conversation you all are having. This is the data behind that conversation. And then this is what it looks like in terms of Colorado. Um, the blue is confirmed. Um, the, the light gray or light brown is persons under investigation. Um, again, this is the deaths that we've seen recently. Um, and then I included these slides. So this is part of the slide deck because I think there's been a lot of conversation about the flu and COVID and the similarities. In terms of the clu Colorado flu report, we've had three hospitalizations with the flu, no outbreaks in long-term care facilities, no pediatric deaths. And so. At this point, um, in terms of the flu, not seeing a lot of activity that's likely to go up. When you look at this, emergency department visits for COVID-related symptoms and diagnosed flu. Um, red is COVID-related systems. Symptoms, blue is diagnosed flu. Um, and then green is the total ED visit. So you can definitely see, once again, what the hospitals are having to deal with. Um, and then this is what it looks like in Boulder County versus the other counties. And again, this is, um, as you can see for this, um, this is, this does not include well in, in the data set. And then finally, um, what Jeff wanted me to share with you um, in terms of the latest picture, we are seeing cases stabilizing, um, but we're continuing to see hospitalizations increasing. We're estimating one in 41 people statewide are infectious with COVID-19. I actually had a question from one of uh, the members of our community to go, well, what's that number for Longmont? We don't have that, um, you know, because they really need to look at it statewide. Um, we may be able to get something on the county level, but um, I haven't seen one. As you know, we're in red um, and you have to be in those other levels for two weeks in order to level down. Um, we are expecting to see increases in cases associated with Thanksgiving based on what we've seen at other holidays. Uh, but more importantly, there is hope with the vaccine. And so you all may have seen before council meeting started, the uh, CDC did vote on, on the distribution piece. 
So they're looking at um, to high priority populations, healthcare, hopefully beginning in late December. Um, Jeff wanted me to reiterate, um, fall and winter is gonna to continue to be a challenge. And um, we're all indoors more, holiday gatherings. And, it, and as we know from the data, the gatherings is where we really saw the increase. Obviously flu mixed with it and then COVID-19 fatigue um, in that people need to stay diligent. We're not that far away from getting the vaccine um, out into our community. You know, we're now talking months. Um, and at the end of the day, um, what I will say is our individual behaviors drive our outcomes. How are we social distancing? How are we reducing gatherings? Are we wearing masks and are we hand washing? Um, because, you know, that's going to be critical for us as we continue to move forward. I will take a breath and now answer any questions you all have. Dr. Waters? Yeah, it's not a question so much, Harold, as you might just spend another moment reflecting on uh, uh, what, how much authority does city council or does the city of Longmont have over um, uh, not the availability, but the priorities for who gets access to a vaccine. We received an email earlier today from a resident uh, who had the impression that somehow we're making that decision. Right, no. <laughs> to clarify for folks, that's not, we have no jurisdiction over who's eligible and when they're eligible. No, because I think, so, the, so that's really important. So obviously you heard me reference the fact that the CDC is, is voting on how the vaccine is going to be distributed. What they did is they solicited input from states and states solicited input from the county health department of which we had representatives on the group who communicated. So what the county health departments did is they made recommendations to the state health department. The state health department sent those recommendations then to the CDC and then the CDC made a decision in terms of what that disbursement is going to look like. And we're getting more clarity on it every week. Um, but if you didn't catch the news, what they really talked about, and I think the available uh, number of vaccines are 40 million, but it's really 20 million people because it's a double vaccine that they have to get. And they talked about frontline healthcare workers and people in um, uh, long-term care facilities. And, and folks go, why that? Well, because you've obviously heard me talk about the impact of the medical system. But no, council, we do not have a, a direct role in that other than we do have staff contributing to the conversation. All right, anybody else? Any other questions? All right, let's move on to the SoulSmart Award presentation. And then we're gonna take a short break as we get ready for public invited to be heard. Hello, this is Tim Ellison. Everybody hear me? Yep. Go ahead, Tim. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bagley and council members. Uh, my name is Tim Ellis, and I'm the Renewable Energy Strategy Manager um, for the Energy, Strate Energy Strategies and Solutions Group at LPC. And I'm um, here tonight because I'm, I'm pleased to present or bring before council the presentation of a Soul Smart Silver Award to Longmont. This award provides national recognition of the city's efforts to help simplify and speed up solar installations by improving the solar permit process. Uh, improvements to the solar permitting process that make it easier for residents and businesses to install arrays is one of multiple ways in which LPC and the city are progressing towards our 100% renewable energy goal. Uh, in addition to the award itself, one example of the national recognition we received already uh, through this award is that Longmont there's our solar feasibility study, which we have recently completed, was highlighted in the most recent SoulSmart monthly newsletter, uh, which is great news. Uh, before I hand over the presentation of the award, I, I'd like to acknowledge some of the city team members who made this award possible. So a big thank you to Assistant City Manager Joni Marsh, Blas Hernandez and his team from Buildings Department, and Ann Lutz from the Energy Strategies and Solutions Group at LPC. Uh, without their efforts, we wouldn't have achieved this success in this award today. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Nick Kaza. Nick's uh, the program manager in sustainability department for the National League of Cities. Nick, can you please go ahead and with the presentation of the award? And Susan, if you could put up the slide that I sent over, that would be great. 
I'll also show the, what the plaque looked like. It's pretty big. I hope to get it in here, but that is the word. So, so Nick, please go ahead. Nick, are you there on mute? There we go. Okay. <laughs> Having a little trouble unmuting. Um, good evening, everyone. Happy to be here this evening with you all. As Tim did mention, my name is Nick Kaza, and I'm a program manager on the sustainability team at the National League of Cities. NLC is one of about a dozen organizations that administer the Soul, the Soul Smart program. I'm here to present the city of Longmont with their Soul Smart silver designation. Soul Smart is a national designation and technical assistance program that recognizes solar energy achievements of local governments. Soul Smart, which is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, also provides assistance to cities and counties to help them improve processes and reduce barriers to solar. Soul Smart designated communities are recognized for making it easier, faster, and more affordable for homes and businesses to install solar energy. As a Soul Smart Silver designee, the city of Longmont joins an exclusive group of 389 communities that have been designated across the United States. And the city is one of 24 communities to be designated in the state of Colorado. This designation demonstrates the city's commitment to sustainable practices and policies and complements the city's 100% renewable energy goal by 2030. With every home or business that installs solar, the city is one step closer to achieving that goal. This silver designation improves Longmont's soul, uh, sorry improves Longmont's improves upon Longmont's bronze designation, which was awarded in 2017. Using objective criteria, Soul Smart designation is awarded to communities that have implemented nationally recognized solar energy best practices in areas such as permitting, inspection, planning, and zoning. In fact, to complete the requirements for silver designation staff from the Building Services Department reviewed an online training series about best practices for solar PV permitting and inspection. Longmont has also streamlined their solar permitting processes, which can save time and money for customers and the city. This designation is in recognition of the work that the city has done to implement solar energy policies and procedures that are transparent, well-defined and documented, and predictable. In recognition of their silver designation, Longmont received the great Soul Smart plaque that Tim was holding up earlier. And as he mentioned, they were also featured in the monthly Soul Smart newsletter. On behalf of the entire Soul Smart team, I'd like to congratulate the city and all the staff that were involved, making sure that Longmont received the recognition it deserves for being a leading solar community in the United States. Hope you all have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. That's All right, great. everybody. Is that it? Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate it. Whenever we get uh, cool awards like the Soul Smart Award, it's awesome. So that means you're doing a good job. So we like seeing that. Councilor Peck, did you want to say something? Oh, I just wanted, I was just waving, but hopefully next year. Thank you very much. I hope next year we get the gold award. <laughs> we'll work on it. Yeah, congratulate them, but just, yeah, just, yeah, you, you can do better, son. You can do better. All right. So let's go ahead and take uh, how many people are currently on the public invited to be heard list? Mayor, we don't have a list. We will wait when we open right. it up and they call in. Right, we we'll do have a group um, lined up to speak on the trash item, the okay. waste services item, um, okay. but they've all got to call in first. So. All right, let's go ahead and take a five minute break then. Be back in a little bit, guys. All right, folks, if you're joining us for Public Invited to be Heard, now is the time to call in. Please dial the number on your screen, enter the meeting ID, and um, make sure that you mute this live stream when you call and listen to the instructions on your telephone. When we are ready to admit you and start the Public Invited to be Heard process, we will call on you by the last three digits of your telephone number. 
at which time you will be able to state your name and address for the record, and then you will have three minutes to speak. So once again, now is your time to call in. Please follow the instructions on your screen and mute the live stream.
I think that's about five, right? Yes, indeed, Mayor. I'll we'll pop them back on. We'll just wait for Council Member Christensen to come back to her chair. And Joan to pop up. We'll go for it. How many are in the queue? I was just trying to count. I think we're we're a little over 20. All right. Let's start the let's start the fun. Looks like 19 people, perhaps. All right. All, all right. <laughs> let's go ahead and start admitting them. All right. So give me just a moment here. Oops. And caller number two, two, three. Caller 223, you should be able to unmute yourself, state your name and address for the record, and then you have three minutes. Caller 223, star six to unmute. Hi, sorry. Molly Briggs, 8245 North 39th Street. Great. Thank you, Molly. And did you have this video to share with us today? Correct. Okay. Here's the deal. We have one planet, but if everyone consumed resources like we do in the United States, we would need five planets worth of resources to keep up. Clearly, that math does not add up. Our consumption is not sustainable. Once we extract natural resources to make them into products, we need to maintain the value of the resources that went into making those products so we can get more in line with the limits of our one planet. That's why we need to keep those resources in the production system as long as possible by recycling as much as we can. We already spent tons of time and energy and money extracting and refining those natural resources into products. So it only makes sense to use and reuse them over and over rather than putting them in the landfill and starting the whole process over again. Our first reason for why recycling makes sense is that it saves a lot of energy. By adopting zero waste strategies, including recycling, we could reduce greenhouse gas 400 million metric tons of CO2 per year, the equivalent of taking more than 20% of U.S. coal-fired power plants off the grid. Manufacturing products from recycled materials saves 30 to 90 percent of the energy needed to manufacture those products from natural resources, and it doesn't require additional extraction of trees, fossil fuels, or metal ores. Making an aluminum can out of recycled aluminum saves 95 percent of the energy required to make the same amount of aluminum from its virgin source. By recycling, we can also reduce demands on new natural resources. Recycling extends the lifespan of materials, reducing pressure on finite natural resources. For example, aluminum cans and glass bottles can be recycled indefinitely. When we recycle these materials, it reduces the need to extract more bauxite or silica from the earth. Once we have those materials, we have them. No need to dig into the earth for more bauxite or silica as long as we quit landfilling the valuable glass and aluminum we've already invested in. Here's another benefit of recycling. Manufacturing. All right. I'm not sure what happened there, but she's got 24 seconds left. So we thank you for your comments. So we'll go ahead to the next caller. All righty. Let's see here, caller. 192, caller 192, are you able to unmute yourself, state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Good evening, I'm Naomi Curlin, and my address is 2073 Goldfinch Court. I'm a board member of Sustainable Resilient Longmont and chair of our Zero Waste Committee. Some of our members are here to speak to you as well, and we're very happy staff is bringing you the waste services presentation tonight. Our Zero Waste team has helped promote composting signups, organize community cleanups, and held events and educational presentations. This past year with COVID, we've put on three Zero Waste webinars, Food Waste and the Climate Connection, Living a Zero Waste Lifestyle in the Time of COVID, and a Food Preservation webinar. 
We also organized a community cleanup in conjunction with the city's cleanup green program in October, and we plan to adopt a park through the city volunteer program in 2021. We are committed to empowering people with good information about sustainable living, and that starts with our consumption impacts. First, I'll provide a little context. Colorado is one of the most wasteful states in our nation, recycling only 15.9% of our waste, less than half the national recycling rate of 35%, and well behind our state's goal to reach 28% diversion by 2021. This sad reality is getting worse with all the growth we're experiencing and the plastics we're consuming. The data shows that boosting recycling and composting participation can provide a real boon to local economies while yielding big environmental benefits. In Longmont, we're diverting about 34% of our residential waste from the landfill, which is better than the state average. However, when com commercial waste is factored in, we're only diverting 24% of the total trash generated in Longmont, which means we're sending 76% to the landfill. And the saddest part is that an estimated 80% of what's being landfilled could have been diverted through composting and recycling. We can and need to do better. Beginning tonight, you will have a huge opportunity for Longmont to step up and improve services to residents, reduce trash generated, and become a leader in our county, region, and state. SRL and our zero waste team is committed to working with the city to reduce materials to the landfill, and we need your leadership setting good policies to do so. Our zero waste team has identified three top priorities for waste services in Longmont. One, providing universal residential composting. Two, requiring commercial recycling. And three, significantly improving outreach and education. These priorities align with the city's sustainability plan and recommendations of the Climate Action Task Force. Incorporating these three will make a big impact now to provide the most benefit to that climate change while empowering residents by improving services. Big problems call for big solutions. Thank you for considering some bold actions to empower the people who live, work, and play in Longmont to step up our efforts to save our precious planet. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next question, or next, uh, next caller. Next caller is caller uh, 962. Caller 962, you should be able to unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record. Caller 962. Hi, this is Tim Broderick, uh, 615 Lincoln Street, uh, Long Island, Colorado. Great, you have three Hello. minutes. 962. Okay, uh, yep. okay. There's some, this is Rachel Zelaya. I live at 948 Rose Street. We, we have two people. And I'm the, the program. Call. Hold on one second. We've got, let's go back to the first caller. Yep, caller 962. Okay, hi, Rachel Zelaya, 948 Rose Street. I'm the program coordinator at Sustainable Resilient Longmont and a member of the city's equitable climate action team. As residents of Longmont, we're fortunate to have municipal services for our waste collection. In addition to good employment, municipal service provides transparency and accountability. It also allows opportunities for resident input and saves us money. None of that would be true with a for-profit private hauler. And um, to prepare for this evening, we've been in contact with Charlie Caminides and Bob Allen of Longmont Way Services. Both Charlie and Bob are to be commended for their vast knowledge, commitment, and excellent communication. Longma is the only municipality in Boulder County to have municipal waste services. This not only gives us the lowest rates in the county, but also in the entire state. Our residents save roughly 30% on our monthly bills compared to neighboring communities who must rely on for-profit trash haulers. It also gives us a lot of autonomy concerning goals and services. For instance, Lafayette struggles to get its many haulers to comply with any policy the city passes. But in Longmont, it's much easier to move forward on our waste diversion goals. Let's take advantage of that. Another benefit is that we only have one hauler coming for our trash recycling and compost. Other cities have private haulers where residents subscribe to different services, which can mean three to five different companies and trucks going into neighborhoods five and six days a week. 
This not only wastes fossil fuels, it causes air and noise pollution. Because we've got municipal services, Longmont is now using waste service trucks powered by biogas from our wastewater treatment facility. And we're the only municipality in the entire state with an every other week trash pickup option. City staff is to be applauded for these cost savings, innovative and environmentally friendly measures. Let's keep going by giving residents more earth friendly, convenient and affordable opportunities by enacting universal composting, commercial recycling, and robust education and outreach. I look forward to hearing how the City of Longmont Municipal Waste Services will take advantage of its power to further reduce carbon emissions for our city through increased waste diversion efforts, ensuring that everyone has access to composting and recycling, and that we do our part to reduce the effects of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, all right, next caller. All right, caller 752. 752, you should be able to unmute yourself. Caller 752. Good evening, Mary Headley, 1615 Bowen Street, Longmont. I'm speaking tonight about SRL's first priority, which is to provide universal residential composting, just as we now provide universal residential recycling by embedding a composting fee in all waste service subscriptions. Here's a summary of why we need more composting. It reduces waste, saves landfill space, improves soil health, boosts agricultural production, conserves water, and helps combat air pollution and climate change. Roughly 40% of Colorado's trash now being landfilled is organic matter, such as food scraps, yard waste, and shredded paper, all of which can be composted. Landfilling organics produces methane, which is many times worse than CO2 in causing global warming. Composting organics instead eliminates this problem. Plus, when compost is applied to soil, the resulting carbon sequestration fights climate change and our poor air quality. Topsoil is enriched as compost pulls CO2 from the air and stores it underground. Healthier soil creates plants that are more resilient to disease and drought. Smaller amounts of polluting fertilizers and pesticides are then needed and less water. Composting not only improves food production, it improves our food's taste and nutritional value. Our grandparents knew the value of composting for their farms, and we should do our part to get back to their wisdom. Currently, Longmont residents opt in for compost service. This requires an extra step to do the right thing and contributes to our low participation rate of only 20%. If people are informed about why composting is important and given education how to do it, and if the service is kept affordable and easy to do, experts predict many more people will get on board. I've been promoting citywide composting since I spoke to city council five years ago. Here are the top reasons people tell me they don't sign up. One, they don't have room for another big bin. Two, they don't generate much organic waste. And three, they just don't understand what composting is all about. That third point will be covered later tonight. To address the first two points, it would be helpful if people could request smaller bins to fit their needs. If all Longmont residents were to have compost service, the economics could support offering bin size options. To keep things simple and financially viable though, our composting service should keep rates for recycling and composting constant, regardless of bin size. In summary, a citywide composting program would provide a valuable service to Longmont residents and could be structured to keep costs affordable. It would also significantly improve our landfill diversion efforts and materially address our sustainability and climate change mitigation goals. All right, I'm going to have to cut you. Thank you. Good, good timing. All right, thank you. All right, next caller. All right, caller number seven eight. Five seven eight five. You should be able to unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record. Hello, my name is Ann Rude, and I live at the shores at McIntosh Lake, two four five zero Airport Road. 
Our second priority is an ordinance requiring commercial recycling, which would also require compost to be collected at multifamily complexes or MFCs. Apartments and businesses produce nearly 50% of waste in Longmont. Most lack curbside recycling and collection, and we're not presently aware of any MFCs that provide compost collection. Requ requiring recycling for commercial sector and MFCs provides a universal benefit. As Naomi mentioned, Due to low recycling efforts by businesses and MSCs, we're sending 76% of the so-called waste generated in Longmont to the landfills. Again, 80% of this can and should be recycled. While some businesses and apartment complexes do the right thing for their workers and residents by providing recycling collection, most simply do not. It's time to raise that bar in Longmont. And I'm, I'm advocating on behalf of my fellow apartment dwellers that in addition to recycling, we're also recommending that MSCs be required to provide their residents with compost collection. I personally used to take my kitchen scraps into my office in Boulder because the office provided composting services. However, since the pandemic, I've been working at home and I have no longer been composting. The convenience of having an easy way to dispose of my compost has just disappeared. If I had on-site composting, I could dispose of more than just kitchen scraps, like the ones I used to take into my office. All Longmont residents deserve convenient access to both recycling and composting, not just homeowners. In conclusion, please direct the staff to write an ordinance requiring recycling and MFCs, which includes compost collection at residential complexes. Doing so will substantially improve our landfill diversion percentages, save and reduce demand for finite resources, save energy, save water, and decrease global warming. Current and future Longmont residents will benefit from your leadership on this. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you for moving Longmont forward on waste diversion efforts, which improve residents' quality of life by doing what's needed. All right, caller ending in 782. 782, you should be able to unmute yourself and uh, state your name and address and you have three minutes. Good evening, council. My name is Garrett Chapel, and I live at 878 Elliott Street. Much of what Anne brought up about multifamily complexes applies to businesses as well. Requiring recycling for the commercial sector as well as MSCs will provide a net benefit to our community. Currently in Colorado, commercial waste collection can legally only be provided by private haulers. The trash hauler lobby was unfortunately successful in getting state laws passed which prohibit municipalities like ours from providing the service to our own residents. As a result, they have no interest in helping to reduce the waste stream because their reality is more trash equals more money. We need the intervention of this ordinance to break this antiquated mindset. 50% of Longmont's waste stream is commercial. We simply cannot ignore the opportunity to do what's right for our community and require recycling collection as part of our commercial waste services. One of the Climate Action Task Force's key recommendations for waste management is to increase person participation in residential and commercial composting to 75% of all homes and businesses by 2025, including a requirement that high organic waste businesses need to compost. If we look around our metro area, it is clear what needs to be done. Fort Collins will require all businesses to have recycling services by 2021 and currently requires all businesses to recycle cardboard and for grocery stores to compost. Boulder already requires all businesses to recycle and compost and additionally asks businesses to separate their own materials. The precedent has been set for us by our neighbors and we need to step up to the plate as a community. We are urging the city council to take a strong stance on this issue through an ordinance requiring all businesses to provide recycling and seize this opportunity to enact real reform in our commercial sector. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. All right, next caller. Caller ending in 350, 350. You should be able to unmute yourself. Good evening, Council. My name is Jamie Ackerson and I live at 2529 Mountain View Ave. There are a couple more recommendations we're hoping you'll also consider before hearing out our third priority. Longmont used to offer a hard to recycle day in partnership with Boulder's EcoCycle. Residents could bring their used or broken electronic items like printers, computers, TVs, and microwaves, in addition to clothing, gym shoes, books, and other things. This happened twice a year at the Martin Street Center. 
but it ended because it was so popular that cars were lined up on Martin in both directions, causing safety concerns. Cost was also cited as the reason that it was suspended as well. But these events were hugely successful in diverting waste. Now residents who want to do the right thing when disposing of these hard to recycle materials must drive to EcoCycle in Boulder. And this is not only inconvenient, but it also wastes Longmont residents gas, time, and money. Staff's report mentions possibly extend, expanding the Martin Street facility to accept more items, but have said that this would likely involve a more a move and probably to a less centralized location. Other options to reestablish this invaluable service might be to have more frequent events with design crowd control measures, like designating who could attend by ward or trash pickup day. Better locations might be the fairgrounds or sanitation offices on airports. The cost of partnering with EcoCycle could be offset by a $10 card suggested donation. Perhaps EcoCycle could also recruit from the 100 plus Longmont Eco Leaders, Eco Leader volunteers, just like they did in the past to assist with directing vehicles, unloading those vehicles, and sorting materials to help maximize efficiency. Very similarly, the city used to also offer a stop and drop twice a year, which was an alternative to the free landfill drop-off day. Rather than drive to Erie, residents went to the facility on Airport Road where staff would unload vehicles and pull steel, bikes, stereos, and many other recoverable items. The resulting diversion percentages were incredibly impressive. Like the charm events, these were also popular with residents, but they were discontinued due to back, backed up traffic on airport road and cost. So similar strategies mentioned for reinstating hard to recycle events could also apply for reinstating stop and job. Finally, our subscription rates could use some minor tweaks to provide more financial incentive for people to take personal responsibility for the waste that they generate. Currently, the monthly subscription for a 96-gallon trash container is $24, but if a household wants a second container, they pay an additional $21.60, but that's actually a 10% discount for producing twice as much trash. Some suggest larger families should receive a break on fees, but we, should, we believe that trash should be regarded like any other volume-based utility rate structure. If you use more gas or water or electricity, then you pay more. Thank you for your time for considering these recommendations in addition to our three priorities. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right, next caller. Next caller is caller 755, 755. Hello, my name is Jasmine Walker and I live at 504 Martin Street, just up the road from the Waste Diversion Center that Jamie was talking about. Tonight, I'm going to speak about how Longmont measured up, measures up with our neighboring communities. I grew up in Longmont, but I've lived in almost all the other cities in Boulder County at some point in my life. So I have direct experience with the actions taken in those communities to improve, improve waste diversion. It's no surprise that the city of Boulder leads the state when it comes to waste diversion. Households and businesses have a 50% citywide recycling rate. Boulder has seen a rapid increase of 17% 17 in waste diversion thanks to the implementation of its universal zero waste ordinance. Before the ordinance, Boulder's business sector was lagging behind and producing over twice as much trash as residents. The ordinance requires that all businesses, apartment complexes, and homes get curbside recycling and compost collection. This policy is helping Boulder move towards its goal of 85% diversion and also addresses their climate action goals to reduce carbon pollution. Similarly, Louisville's overall diversion rate is 44%. Longmont is lagging behind at just 36% for residential and a mere 24% when the commercial sector is factored in. Sending two thirds of our residential trash and 76% overall to the landfill is just not acceptable. Loveland, the L town a little bit north of Longmont has a 60% diversion rate. Loveland and Longmont are some of the only cities in the state to have, that munici to have municipal waste services. By having these municipal waste services, our subscription rates are more than 30% less than if we were to use for-profit haulers. When interviewed about Loveland's diversion success, Tyler Bandemer, the solid waste superintendent, indicated that when they developed their curbside compost and recycling program about 20 years ago, they focused on providing an easy way to participate, along with a pay-as-you-throw program. He explained that depending on how ardent residents are with their efforts, they save money on their trash bills by selecting smaller trash containers. 
I can personally attest to this. In 2019, when I moved back to my hometown of Longmont, I was excited to be able to sign up for curbside compost collection, and I opted for every other week's trash service. I have found that my bill is low, even though we get the added benefit of um, curbside compost pickup. My preference would be to offer a smaller compost container and an option for a once a month trash collection. When a big portion of our waste goes into the compost bin, not only is it better for the planet, but you simply don't need the large and more costly garbage bins. I'd gladly put, pay the same subscription rate to move to a once a month model, but perhaps providing a bigger savings incentive would help move our diversion needle while rewarding residents who are less wasteful. While we all know Longmont has its own unique identity and we want to keep it that way, we can catch up with our neighbors when it comes to improving waste diversion rates by adopting similar practices without having to reinvent the wheel. Let's set the necessary policies to improve our landfill diversion rates, save resources, and empower our residents. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, next caller. All right, next caller is caller 452. 452. Good evening, Sherry Malloy, 2113 Rangeview Lane. I'm speaking to our team's third priority. Again, the first two are residential universal compost collection and required commercial recycling. Our third priority is significantly improving outreach and education efforts regarding waste reduction. Good ordinances need to be paired with good outreach, education, and support. To bring Long Run forward with more composting, commercial recycling, multifamily composting, charm, and stop and drop events, Residents will need to be well-informed and well-supported. This must start with once again embracing the term zero waste. Zero waste is a set of principles focused on significant waste reduction. The goal is for no trash to be sent to landfills, incinerators, or oceans. A zero waste strategy needs to ensure everyone has access to tools to reduce, reuse, and recycle waste where they live, work, and play. Ordinances which result in changes to human behavior must have community buy-in to achieve success. We have a world-renowned, local, community-based nonprofit who has been doing this work in Boulder County for the last 45 years. Since 1976, EcoCycle has been pushing the envelope to live up to their mission, which reads, quote, transform society's throwaway ethic into environmentally responsible stewardship, end quote. Longmont Sanitation and EcoCycle worked hand-in-hand -hand for many years, but their relationship has deteriorated over the last several years. The rationale has been that Longmont would address internally what EcoCycle was doing with its unique improvement community engagement strategies. While that is a rational and understandable approach, it simply hasn't reproduced the results we need. As Naomi said, we're sending 76% of our waste to the landfill. To be effective, we need EcoCycle. EcoCycle has the massive benefit of already having done the heavy lifting of community outreach, engagement, education, and empowerment regarding composting, commercial recycling, and multifamily outreach throughout Boulder County and beyond. With over 130 eco-leaders in Longmont ready to help, EcoCycle can help move us closer to realizing our sustainability and climate action goals. It's worth mentioning that it was EcoCycle who was an incredible resource to myself and several other invested residents in organizing and lobbying a former city council to get our current curbside compost tax collection passed. They know how to get it done, and we need to get it done, so let's get it done. Our, eco, our zero waste... Apologies, that, that was a trip on my mouse. All right, Sher Sherry, call back in, and we'll, we'll give you the I remainder of your time. I'll admit her right now. She's just in the waiting room. I didn't okay. hang up. I just Perfect. hit the All wrong right. thing. Um, give me just a sec here. All right, Sherry, are you with us? Sherry, yes. could, you, could you back up to the... So sorry about that. Sherry, could you back up to the beginning of your, your last point where you said, and third? And third. Well, there, you, you, there was a, there was a, you were starting a thought. So go back to the, the thought and start that again, please. To the thought? No, 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 no. What I mean is you, you, we, we dropped you. You got pushed to the waiting room. I know. I so know. Just, just what I'm saying is don't pick up where you were. Go ahead of that. I mean, go back in time and start with a full thought so you're not just... So I see. Really, okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So EcoCycle knows how to get it done, and we need to get it done. 
They were an incredible resource to myself and several other investor residents in organizing and having our former council to get our current curbside compost collection passed. Our zero waste team is committed to being a resource and will continue to do zero waste webinars for now and live programs when appropriate. We are supporting SVBSD student eco groups advocating for more Green Start schools in Longmont. We're here to help. We just need your leadership for not only good policy, but also the right approach. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sherry. All right. Next caller. Excellent. Thank you. Um, caller 343. 343. Hello. Okay. All right. We all hit it. Caller 343, you can state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Okay. Hello, my name is Anna Greer. I live on 205 Fifth Avenue. I'm a senior high school student and the president of Longmont High School's Environment Club, and I'm a final speaker on our zero waste team. In the wake of dire warnings about the need for immediate action on climate pollution and the equally alarming proliferation of plastic pollution in our oceans, there has never been a more important time for us to double down on our commitment to protect our environment and build smart, sustainable communities. Taking individual responsibility for waste diversion should be at the cornerstone of our commitment. It is an accessible, simple solution where everyone can and needs to participate. People want to do the right thing. It just needs to be convenient, affordable, and well supported by good outreach and education. You have an important opportunity tonight to direct staff to work on design changes to our waste services that empower Longmont residents to move the needle individually and collectively in the right direction. To quote from the report in your council communication, quote, over the years, city surveys have indicated that Longmont's solid waste program is widely popular with residents. Longmont's community awareness for environmentally sound waste diversion options comes from a sense of community pride in doing the right thing. It goes on to read, discussions on options and programs with the community are always informed and well-reasoned. Longmont residents have continually expressed a strong willingness to pursue increasing aggressive waste diversion techniques. Some resistance to program change can always be expected because solid waste programs are built upon customer habits which aren't always easy to change. For that reason, changes in the waste services program are made only when they are built upon clear goals, achievable objectives, and reliable revenue projections." End quote. Some of these clear goals we're hoping you will direct staff on include universal curbside composting, required commercial recycling, improving outreach and education, more incentives regarding the fee structure, and restoring the charm and stop and drop events. Two additional rather low-hanging fruit for simple policy improvements include requiring zero waste for all city-sponsored events and requiring zero waste planning be included in permitting for use of public places. I'd like to add, while our group would love to go further with such things as suggesting a ban on single-use plastic and styrofoam and prohib prohibiting yard waste from residential trash, we're being realistic with what we're asking for. I'll end with a quote from staff council communication. The benefits of recycling are unquestionable, but any community seeking to reduce trash haul to landfills will need to consider programs that work on both sides of the equation, solid waste recycling and solid waste reduction. Thank you for listening to all our remarks and especially for moving Longmont forward to address the important issue. All right, thank all right. you. Uh, caller 795 is next, 795. Uh, 615 Lincoln Street. Good evening, City Council and Mayor. My name is Tim Broderick, and I am the Senior Sustainability Strategist focused on circular economy efforts within Boulder County's Office of Sustainability, Climate Action, and Resiliency. The 2019 Boulder County Waste Composition Study found that nearly two-thirds of materials sent to the landfill in Boulder County could have been recovered. Recycling and composting these materials would have saved 245,000 tons of carbon emissions annually, the equivalent of taking approximately 50,000 passenger cars off the road each year. Boulder County has a goal of zero waste or darn near by 2025 and is collaborating with municipalities to reach this milestone. A part of that collaboration is supporting efforts by municipalities to take steps to require composting and recycling at residential and commercial locations. Boulder County's Office of Sustainability, Climate Action, and Resiliency would like to publicly support any efforts moving towards zero waste ordinances by the City of Longmont. Through the 2020 Boulder County Zero Waste Scorecard, we know that these policies have the highest impact on municipal solid waste diversion and greenhouse gas reduction. If 
you have any questions regarding the scorecard or county circular economy programming, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you for your time and consideration of supporting these future city program elements. All right, caller 209. 209, you should be able to unmute yourself, state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here. My name is Tracy Whipple, and I live at 19 Western Sky Circle, and I'm here to talk about my concerns with a proposed Costco location. Like my neighbor who spoke a couple weeks ago, I bought my home after consideration of the gravel operation east of Martin Street. The gravel operation was not originally disclosed by the builder, so some people voiced their dismay. I decided that short-term digging with mitigations was a temporary inconvenience for the long-term ponds and wetlands as described in the Irwin Thomas development plan. Previous neighbors fought that plan, but they were told it was a quote, done deal. Obviously it wasn't a done deal and the city has changed their mind <clears throat> and decided a warehouse in our backyard is better for us than wetlands. Now, I do support the idea of Costco and affordable housing in Longmont, and I fully understand that this is beneficial in many ways, but I do not think this proposed location is the best option, and I'll offer some suggestions momentarily. It was stated previously that Costco stores do not have a negative impact on property values, so I thought I'd test that theory. I randomly selected five stores in the Denver area, Superior, Thornton, Westminster, Arvada, and Littleton, to compare homes right by the Costco versus those in the neighborhood. That comparison was not actually possible because none of these stores have single family homes right by those warehouses. Maybe Longmont Planning Department should review our criteria for zoning and make sure this is really what we want to do to a newly constructed neighborhood. It's been stated that Costco selected this location, but of course that does not sound like the proud city ownership and internal locus of control that our city council has or should have for Longmont. In other words, it is your decision, not that of Costco. You can say no. Notwithstanding the moderate homes in Harvest Junction, I don't think it's okay to locate affordable housing right next to a warehouse. Why would they want to live in the shadow of a massive warehouse? Do you want to live in such a shadow? As a point of reference, the nearest home in Harvest Junction is 634 feet to Michaels, whereas the proposed location of Costco is only 126 feet to the Watermark Apartments and 380 feet to the nearest Harvest Junction home, and it abuts the proposed affordable housing site. Thus far, communication with council members has been about tall trees and landscaping as a barrier, but there are better options that I'd like to the city to consider. For example, could the Costco be shifted east a bit, allowing more room for green space between Martin Street and the Costco? Or could the whole site be moved as far east as beside the Walmart on 119 or somewhere in between, like on the other side of the newly proposed road off of 119? The current location is not optimal for many existing residents, which is probably why other cities nearby do not locate a Costco adjacent to a neighborhood. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to working with the city on an optimal solution in bringing Costco to Longmont. All right, next, next caller. Caller 255, caller 255, you should be able to unmute yourself. Caller 255, are you with us? All I'm right. Join you tonight. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of Longmont City Council. It is my pleasure to join you tonight to talk about my favorite topic, zero waste. My name is Randy Mormon and I'm the Director of Legislative and Community Campaigns at EcoCycle. As many of you know, EcoCycle has been working with the city of Longmont since 1984 with the launch of the drop-off center and curbside recycling collection, one of the first in the country using volunteers and retired school buses. We have come a long way and today, according to our latest state of recycling and composting in Colorado report, Longmont is ranked in the top 10 front range municipalities for residential recycling tied at number four with Lafayette at 36% diversion. I wanna recognize the hard work of the city staff, Dale Rademacher, 
Bob Allen and Charles Caminitas in getting us to this point by expanding and improving city recycling and composting services. So how does the city of Longmont get to be ranked in the top three? What will, what will we have to do to have the biggest impact in both diversion and reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Well, I have three recommendations for you. One is expand the city's organic waste collection program. Approximately a third of our waste head of the landfills organic food waste and yard debris. Following other leading cities, the next important step for Longmont is to transition from a voluntary program to one that provides curbside compost collection to all its residents, funneled as part of their waste services. Boulder County's plan to build an in-county compost facility will make such an expansion more economically feasible. Number two, require businesses and multifamily complexes to recycle. 66% of Longmont's waste comes from the commercial sector, and only 10% of that is now recycled. Requiring these businesses and multifamily complexes to recycle could divert nearly twice as many tons as residential programs. And more specifically, a universal zero waste ordinance similar to what Boulder has levels the playing field for all businesses. Boulder's citywide recycling rate has increased now 10% in the last four years as a result of this ordinance. And number three, require contractors to pay a recycling deposit that is returned once they show they have recycled valuable construction materials. Nearly a third of what Boulder County sends to landfills is construction waste, making it the single largest source of waste. A construction and demolition recycling policy could have a big impact. This is an exciting time for Longmont to take the next step in zero waste as the state's front range waste diversion fund or forward grant was launched this year and provide over $10 million a year to front range communities. The city could apply for grants to pay for these new programs such as new compost carts. We at EcoCycle are ready to partner with the city on outreach and education to make these programs successful. We also want to continue to work with the city to expand the EcoCycle Green Star Schools program. Um, the city's support is needed to maintain an active program in the 10 current schools and to expand the program to new schools. We know the value of educating children and youth in zero waste and those same uh, Green Star school students grow up to be recyclers and composters as adults. I hope you will consider these recommendations. Thank you for your time and work to make City of Longmont a leader in zero waste. All right, caller 722, caller 722. Hello. Hi, my name is Lynette McLean and I am a resident of Longmont at Sandpoint Drive. I just wanted to say quickly that um, I listened to Governor Cuomo talk about uh, COVID in New York, and he he had a, a an interaction with someone who was just outraged uh, at having to um, wear a mask and the requirement that he not allow anyone to celebrate his holiday with him. And Governor Cuomo said to the guy. Um, well, I'll tell you what, you go ahead and have as many people over to your house as you want to, but if any of them get sick, then you handle that. Don't bring them into our hospitals and infect our doctors and our, our caregivers. And of course, the guy wasn't interested in doing that. So um, it just made me think of what Mayor Bagley did. And I just want to thank you for stepping up. And I want to thank you for taking a stand on this issue. You just really um, communicated all of our frustration at watching people not socially distance and wear their masks under their noses and um, and uh, realize how hard it is to go through this ourselves and how those kinds of folks are putting their own freedom above our community's wealth welfare. So thanks so much. And with that, I resign and thank you. <laughs> Good night, everybody. You know, George can stands it and just call it, call it a decade. Bye, no, just kidding. All right. All right, uh, next caller. All right, uh, caller 949. 949, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, this is Ruby Bowman. I have comments about the Riverside property, 1512 Left Hand Drive in Longmont. City staff contends the Riverside property is not a former landfill. I do not think the issue has been resolved. Council should look further into the matter. In my written comments to the Planning and Zoning Commission for their February 19th hearing on the annexation, I referred to page nine of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers draft St. Rain Feasibility Report 
which identified the Riverside property as a potential constraint in the study area because it was a former landfill site. Quote, avoid landfill north of Boston Avenue and Sunset adjacent to the St. Frank Creek, unquote. I confirmed this with the Army Corps engineer official at the Corps meeting in Longmont on September 18th, 19, on 2019. The official told me the Corps reviewed aerial photos of the property and it showed a lake or pond on the property. The question in his mind was how did the lake get filled up? There is no lake there now. Two hours before the planning and zoning hearing, I received an email from the city planner stating the Corps changed their mind about the landfill reference and would remove it from its final draft. She wrote, we will let the commission know as well tonight. Based on staff's emails I reviewed, a public works employee contacted the Army Corps of Engineers on the day of the planning and zoning hearing to get the landfill reference removed. Just because the Corps removed it from its final report doesn't mean it invalidates the landfill issue. I was given a copy of an aerial photo dated February 12, 1976 by a Longmont city official, which shows a lake covering the entire Riverset property. The $64 million question for council is how did the hole where the lake was located get filled up and what type of material was used to fill the lake? I also came across a 1980 environmental health report by the Boulder City County Health Department. It was a complaint about illegal dumping on the Riverset property. There was a diagram on the complaint showing where clean fill and trash were deposited on the property. Another document I found is a 1976 letter to the State Health Department in which Boulder City County Health indicates, quote, rubble dumping has recently been initiated, on, unquote, on what is now called the Riverset property. The landfill issue is still a viable one. Council should look further into the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. How many callers do we have left? Three left, Mayor. Okay. All right, so caller ending in 479. 479, you should be able to unmute yourself, state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Caller 479. Star six to unmute. Hello, my name is Michael Hannon. I'm at 16495 Gray's Way in Broomfield. I represent Holly Cook with respect to the request to use the Quicksilver Road route as a transportation hauling route from the Irwin Thomas Mine. Uh, I already have previously written to several uh, officials, including Mr. Harold Dominguez, who I hope may have forwarded my letter on to the members of the council. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Mr. Mayor and all the other members of the council for being so concerned about the health of the area residents. And this uh, proposal certainly will affect the uh, health of my client along Quicksilver Road. Uh, hopefully, again, as I say, I don't want to have to read that letter into the record and that Mr. Dominguez will have forwarded it on and made it a part of tonight's record. Uh, but I also want to point out one serious issue with respect to this requirement, I mean, to this uh, uh, application. It is our opinion that uh, Ms. Cook never has received a legally required notice for this proposal. And as such, that uh, we believe that this proposal really needs to go back in time to uh, her being properly noticed so we can go forward. There's no question we believe that uh, such a proposal will seriously impact the value of a $2 million project that she is proposing to build on this uh, site. And uh, in addition to the negative impacts of the 
uh, uh, building itself. Uh, there will also be negative impacts to the health of her family, uh, who she and most others actually suffer from asthma. So anyway, again, I really hope that the letter will be made part of the uh, record. I've already forwarded it uh, back on to uh, Mr. Rademacher, who was also copied in again at the time back on October 8th of this objection. And I've also contacted counsel for aggregate and advised counsel that we were willing to discuss uh, issues with them, provided that she would uh, talk about other possible alternatives, but to date have never been contacted or had any response. Uh, at this time, I'd really like to thank counsel for its uh, uh, allowing me to speak before them and hope that they'll take seriously uh, the items that have been already uh, written into uh, members of council, uh, both in Bol uh, commission in Boulder and to uh, various staff members of the city of Longmont. Right, thank, thank you for thank your thank you, attention. Sir. All right. Okay, next caller. All right, uh, caller 602, caller 602. Bingo. Hi, my name is Heidi McIntyre. I live at 1782 Sunshine Avenue. Good evening, Mr. Uh, Mayor Bagley and City Council. As a concerned longtime citizen of Longmont and the surrounding area, your continued policies and reactions to COVID-19 have compelled me to call in tonight. In particular, Mayor Bagley's behavior and comments in reaction to the Weld County elected officials' decisions regarding the COVID-19 restrictions are both extremely embarrassing and disturbing. As he mentioned in his follow-up statements on November 25th, as elected officials, you all take an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, Colorado, and local laws, and yet fail to consider before speaking that the request to pursue an ordinance for denial of health care would not only cause every health worker in our city and county to violate their Hippocratic oath which includes protecting all life and to renounce self-interest in the treatment of patients. But it also put local, puts local residents in danger of not having critical access to health care. I believe the Weld County, um, Weld County response to the COVID-19 restrictions as addressed by their commissioner, in fact, take into account the full picture for all of their residents, including not only the physical health of their constituents, but also the mental, financial and future well-being, which I believe is a major part of the picture you all are missing. The City Council's vision for Longmont specifically states that Longmont will be the world's greatest village where children are most fortunate to be born and raised. Elders are supported through their entire life journey and where people will have access to food, shelter, and everyone has the opportunity to thrive and feel they belong. From my perspective, your continued support of the extreme restrictions causing businesses to reduce capacity, close, and causing people to lose jobs is in direct conflict with this vision. I would respectfully ask that you take a step back and view the forest instead of the proverbial trees. I believe if you do so, you will begin to better understand the unpopular stand that the Weld County Commissioners have decided to take in putting the overall best interest of their residents above the current fear of the COVID virus. In March, the leadership said the end goal was to reduce the strain on the health facilities and flatten the curve. Nine months in, I would ask you, what is the real end goal? Considering the data published on Colorado.gov, all of Colorado, including Weld and Boulder County, have the same 1% death rate of those that contract the virus. This brings into question whether the stricter standards you all are choosing to follow is doing anything other than killing our businesses and future sustainability. I sincerely hope you'll take this feedback to heart and look forward to seeing changes in your policies in the coming weeks. Thank you. All right, next caller. All right, caller 305, 305. Hi everyone, my name is Megan Arnold and I live at One Western Sky Circle. I'm also a member of the advisory board for the Longmont Museum. I'm excited about the Costco development and very much in support of what it could be. However, I was surprised by how one-sided the November 17th presentation appeared. The plan as it was presented doesn't reflect the balanced, visionary and responsible growth strategies I've come to expect and deeply appreciate about the city of Longmont's leadership. 
sustainable and equitable growth is the challenge of our generation and Longmont is experiencing a profound moment in its history when this is attainable. I'm surprised that there has been nothing shared by the city so far on its plans to balance the development with parks, green space, and investment in schools or small businesses or in requirements for sustainable business practices. I'm happy to see the development bring more affordable housing to Longmont and doing so in conjunction with the Costco warehouse. But I am surprised that city council has not taken into consideration the benefits of a park or greenway that the benefits that would bring to those residents. It shouldn't just be the wealthy residents who enjoy the greenway between Lowe's and the west side of Harvest Junction. This isn't the last time we will be discussing development along East Ken Pratt. And I'd like to mention to all of us that sustainable growth isn't just about direct tax revenue. Parks and green space benefit the whole community and we all know how critical they are to both the actual and perceived value of that community. The cost though, will be the first thing many people see when they enter Longmont. We have an opportunity to grow more equitably than Boulder and more sustainably than Thornton or Westminster. Longmont must continue to be a beautiful place to live, not just a convenient place to shop or a prosperous place to work. Parks, green space, and sustainable, equitable growth are not just vanity acts from residents. They're an economic imperative, and we have a chance in Longmont to do this better. And the cost for development is too impactful to ignore the vision Longmont's residents have for their community. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is that it for public invite? First call public invited to be heard? That was all of our callers for first call. All right, great. Then uh, let's go on to, actually, let's go ahead. We doing okay? Can we get through the consent agenda before we take a break, guys? All right, let's just do the consent agenda. So we're going to go ahead and read it. We're pulling D and I. So let's go ahead and read the others. Mayor, uh, item 9A is ordinance 2020-65. A bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for the expenses and liabilities of the City of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2020. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for December 15th, 2020. 9B is Ordinance 2020-66, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 3.04.610, paid holidays designated of the Longmont Municipal Code on personnel rules. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for December 15th, 2020. 9C is Ordinance 2020-67, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 14.08 of the Longmont Municipal Code by adding Section 14.08.647 to allow for adjustment to wastewater billing for commercial and industrial use of cooling water. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for December 15, 2020. 9D is Ordinance 2021-01, a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the River Set Annexation, generally located north of Boston Avenue and east of Sunset Street, and zoning the property MUE, mixed use employment. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for January 12th, 2021. 9E is ordinance 2020-69, a bill for an ordinance designating the James and Francis Wiggins House at 534 Emory Street as a local historic landmark. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for December 15th, 2020. 9F is Ordinance 2020-70, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the City of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport, Hangar Parcel NH-T2, to KLMO Hangar Gang, LLC. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for December 15, 2020. 9G is Ordinance 2020-71, a bill for an ordinance repealing and reenacting Chapter 11.04 of the Longmont Municipal Code regarding the Model Traffic Code, and adopting the 2020 edition of the Model Traffic Code for Colorado by reference. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for December 15, 2020. 9H is Resolution 2020-128, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the Department of Navy for a cooperation with civilian law enforcement officials agreement. 9I was pulled from the agenda. 9J has approved the 2021 City Council meeting schedule. All right. Uh, Councilor Martin. Um, I move the consent agenda except for D and I. Councilor Christensen. Oh, okay. I was going to call, I was going to pull D too. So. All right. Then we'll go ahead and take that as a second. Is that okay, Councilor Christensen? All right. So it's been moved by Councilor Martin, seconded by Councilor Christensen. Uh, any debate on this? Obviously not because it's the consent agenda. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the consent agenda passes unanimously. Let's go ahead. So everybody who is currently listening to this live stream, uh, if you would please go ahead and call in now. Um, I don't care what 
ordinance on second reading you'd like to talk about, go ahead and call in now. So we will go ahead and take a three minute break. And then when we come back, we'll go through and we'd like to have you ready online listening to the live stream when we go ahead and open up each ordinance on second reading for public, uh, public hearing. So go ahead and call in now, please. We'll take a three minute break. We'll be back in three. All right, folks, this is um, public hearing. Time to call in for public hearing on any of these agenda items here. Um, once again, dial the number on your screen, enter the meeting ID, and please remember to mute the live stream when you call and listen to the instructions that are on your telephone. And uh, we will call you by the last three numbers of your telephone number, at which point you will be able to speak.
right, everybody, we all back? All right, we're all back. Let's go ahead and start with ordinances on, ordinances on second reading, along with their public hearings. We're going to go ahead with 10A, Ordinance 2020-59, a bill for an administrative ordinance approving the grant of a deed of conser <clears throat> conservation easement in gross from the city of Longmont to the Longmont Conservation District on the Newbie Farms open space property. Um, Councilmember Christensen. I move ordinance 2020-59. I'll second it. Let's go ahead and add the public hearing and then we're gonna redo that motion if that's okay. All right. So let's go ahead and open the public hearing on ordinance 2020-59. All right, so uh, I believe it is star nine to raise your hand. If any of our four callers on the line would like to speak on A, please star nine to raise your hand. Anybody? All right, Mayor, I do not see anybody raising their hand. All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. We have a motion from Councilmember Christensen. I seconded it, but we'll give the second to Susie. Um, any further debate on this issue? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. The motion carries unanimously. All right, ordinance uh, item 10B, ordinance 2020-60, the bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport Hangar Parcel H-14B to Craig Nelson. Let's go ahead and open the public hearing on ordinance 2020-60. Hit star nine if you'd like to raise your hand. Anybody? Okay, not seeing anybody. Let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Do we have a motion? Council Member Christensen. I move ordinance 2020-60. Second. All right, it's been moved by Council Member Christensen, second by Dr. Waters. All in favor of ordinance 2020-61, say aye. Oh, aye. Sorry, 2020-60. Aye. Let's go ahead. And aye, still. Aye, still aye, aye, everybody. All right, nay. All right, ordinance 2020-60 passes unanimously. Ordinance 2020-61, item 10C, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport Hangar Parcel H-37 to Robert Singer. Let's go ahead and open the public hearing on ordinance 2020-61. All right, seeing nobody, let's go ahead and do we have a motion. We're going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Sorry, motion, Councilmember Martin. Okay. I'm assuming that was a motion, right? I said I move 10C. Oh, I was, okay. I'll second it. All right. Any further discussion, debate? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right. Ordinance 2020-61 passes unanimously. Let's go on to, uh, so I want to just flag anybody who wants to talk on this issue. This is uh, item 10D, number one, two, three, four, five, and six. We're going to have the public hearing all at the same time, but then we're going to go ahead and vote on these individually. So we're going to go ahead and wait about 60 seconds that if you want to talk on anything pertaining to item 10D, the Costco Economic Development Incentive and Associated Agreement and Purchase of Nine Acres for the Development of Affordable Housing, we would ask that you would call in now. Star nine to raise your hand if you wanted to speak on 10D. Anybody? We have a couple of callers who have raised their hand for this. All right. Why don't you go ahead and call them then, pursuant to their last uh, last four digits, and we'll go from there. Great. So caller ending in 132, you should be able to unmute yourself. And uh, you have three minutes. Caller one, three, two. Star six to unmute.
All right, let's try caller 430. Caller 430, you should be able to unmute and state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Hi, thank you for hearing me today. My name is Holly Cook. Um, the address for me is 12525 Quicksilver Road. Um, I am calling in tonight um, because I am highly opposed to the agreement for aggregate industries to use Quicksilver Road as a shortcut. Um, I do know that they were already approved to use um, Ken Pratt Highway, which is much better equipped. It has the correct infrastructure. Um, I purchased uh, three and a half acres on Quicksilver about a year ago, um, primarily because it was on a quiet, unpaved country road surrounded by farmland um, that is predominantly county open space. And as you can imagine, the appeal of that was it's a quiet country location. I am well into working with architects, engineers, um, uh, site plan review, the whole process, um, and was accidentally informed of this potential for aggregate to use Quicksilver Road. Quicksilver Road is not really even wide enough for two cars to pass each other. It's not paved. It's not rated for heavyweight traffic. And I am very concerned about how it will affect my plans for my family home, um, having my children on this road with hundreds of trucks on it every day. Um, a couple of us have serious allergies and asthma. So I'm looking at issues with dust being picked up all day. I'm concerned about my teenage sons being, you know, learning to drive and being on this road with big heavy gravel trucks every day. Um, I'm concerned about my only neighbor who has lived on this road for decades, who are entering retirement age and love to be outside. That's one of the things I'm looking forward to with this new home is being able to spend time in the peaceful outdoors, which is the opposite of 300 gravel trucks every day passing my house. I did hire an attorney. Um, he called in earlier. Um, I guess it wasn't the appropriate time. I'm I think you might be calling back. Um, and we have made multiple attempts to communicate a lot of concerns about this issue and try to get some communication going um, and really have been stonewalled, to be quite honest. Um, there's nothing I can do with somebody who won't talk with me and try to work out some solutions. Um, I have proposed alternate routes or suggestions, and I really think that if aggregate was really concerned about environmental protection, there are other mitigation measures they could take um, and in possible other locations. Thank you for your time. Good timing, thank you. All right, next caller for public invited to be heard on 10D, the Costco Economic Development Incentive. All right, let's try caller 132 again. Are you able to unmute yourself? Caller 132. Oh. Excellent. Hello? You can state, hello, you can state your name and address for the record and you have three minutes. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Michael Gunderson and I live on uh, Quicksilver Road, 12335 Quicksilver Road. And uh, I'm not used to going on virtual here, but uh, uh, so please excuse me if I mess it up. But anyway, uh, it's an honor to talk to you uh, people. And uh, I was told that back, I don't know, six months ago from Jane's, uh, I think it was Michael Thomas that came over and met with me and Julie at our home and told us that uh, we had the right to deny the uh, use of aggregate industries using our road and uh, uh, as you know to drive 300 trucks down in a day to transport their dirt over to the other processing plant so we are greatly uh, you know we're begging you <clears throat> not to use uh, <clears throat> 
not to allow them to do this. Uh, we haven't. Uh, I'm kind of shocked because no one's contacted me, and this is um, uh, just heard about it. But I, I represent 100% of the people living on Quicksilver Road, and I represent probably most of the people that are using the bike path, the wonderful bike path uh, the city of uh, Longmont put in that goes to the Sandstone Ranch. And, you know, me and my wife, uh, you know, I've been a, a member, I've been a, a small businessman in, in Boulder and Longmont for 50 years now. So I've probably worked on every neighborhood there is in, in uh, Boulder and working on, working on many, many neighborhoods in Longmont too. But anyway, uh, we just beg you not to uh, approve this resolution to use our road to uh, transport all that dirt. It would not work for us. You know, I have asthma and my wife is, uh, she can't go nowhere it's because she has macular degeneration and to have 300 trucks go down our road. And we have 12 grandchildren that uh, come over all the time and we wouldn't, you know, you would be destroying our family. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for your time. And I just uh, hope you do the right thing. And, 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 uh, and please let us know what's going on because no one's contacted us. Just like Holly had called a little while ago. No one's contacted us. They offered to, you know, give us money. And we didn't talk to the people because, you know, we were told that we didn't you know, have to uh, sell out. But uh, they offered to put up a 10-foot fence in front of our house and maybe replace our windows. But we don't want – we just want to live here in peace and quiet. And maybe uh, – I don't know. I just thank you for your time, and I'll let you get on. You guys are wonderful that you put up with all these people, talk, call, and, and uh, <laughs> I've uh, never witnessed this before. So anyway, have a good evening, and put a smile on your face. Thank you very much for your time. Thank uh, you, bye. Sir. Thank you. Um, so before we get going, Dale, so my question is, I recall an email saying that before we go through each of these ordinances, I, I mean, one of the questions I have for, I don't want to start approving ordinances and then get to a point where we've approved something that we, we need, I, they're all kind of together. So I figure ask now, did we contact these people? Because I saw that we tried, but they didn't respond and I'm not hearing that. I, I, who owns the road? Um, what's going on? Uh, do we have to let aggregate use it? What's the consequences if we say no? Should we say no? Um, because if they're the only people on, this is a, I just feel like we're about ready to bully a family that doesn't want this. And it sounds like it's their road. Is that true? So what, what, uh, Mayor Bagley and issue? Mayor Bagley, members of council, uh, Dale Rademacher, deputy city manager. Um, I'll also offer to have Jim Engstead, the director of, of uh, engineering, speak to you as well. Uh, Jim was the city staff member who did talk with uh, the Gundersons um, earlier this year. Um, and then he had several attempted uh, discussions with them following that. Um, and as I recall uh, from Jim, uh, was was told in pretty much no uncertain terms, um, they didn't want to discuss it any further. They, they, they just didn't want it to happen and refused to have any further discussions with the uh, city staff on that matter. Um, we simply, um, so, so frankly, it's very difficult to have a discussion with someone who, who will not um, um, have that discussion. Um, Secondly, this is a Boulder County um, public road. So it is not a private road. It is a public road under the maintenance and care of Boulder County, uh, which is why uh, the IGA is in front of the council this evening. Um, the city um, negotiated with Boulder County on the various aspects of the intergovernmental agreement uh, that is intended and uh, to address and mitigate uh, many of the potential issues that may impact the two adjacent private property owners. Um, things that are in the IGA are things such as grading the roadway so that it is safe for truck traffic, lowering the speed limit on the roadway, 
putting in dust mitigation frequently to prevent dust, and then uh, putting up a traffic light, a temporary traffic light at the intersection of Quicksilver Road and 119th. What's important, I believe, for us all to know is that the use of Quicksilver Road has been the desire of the city for some time, predating any issue with the Costco development. Uh, and in fact, we entered into discussions with Boulder County as far back as 2018 on the issue. The reason we believe it is the preferred route is that we believe the intersection of 119th and, and Ken Pratt Boulevard is a very dangerous intersection with very high speeds and high traffic volumes. And when you have left turn uh, movements being made as the trucks return back to the mine, uh, we believe that's an incredibly dangerous uh, situation. On top of that, the Quicksilver route is by far the shortest route between A and B, uh, resulting in a significant reduction of greenhouse gas generation, um, which, which we all know is, is part of what we're all trying to do to be um, uh, more sustainable in, in, in an operation. And so, we had months and months of discussions with Boulder County on the matter. The county also um, indicated that it was their desire that financial mitigation also be provided to the two private property owners. That is included in the IGA as well as the agreement between the city and aggregate industries. Uh, it's, a, it's a sum of $180,000 to each of the property owners. Well, that was an amount that uh, so, so, so we did not come up with that amount. They, City staff they, didn't. Oh, no, yeah, sorry. So, so if they don't own the road, Boulder County is paying each of these property owners one hundred and eighty thousand. What are they paying one hundred and eighty thousand for? So, Boulder County is not paying it. Aggregate Industries will be paying them one hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and I believe it was the. Um, desire of Boulder County to attempt uh, additional mitigation for their county residents. Again, the, the, these two residents are outside of the city limits. They are county residents and the county uh, felt that was an appropriate um, step to take as well. So and they, they could use the road even if they didn't pay the 180,000, right? Um, in my opinion, the use of the public road um, certainly is available without having to pay. Uh, for instance, it is not the practice of the city of Longmont when we are doing construction activities or using uh, any city street or public road to pay the adjacent neighbors to do that work or, or to use that public right away. Councilmember Martin? Yes, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I understood from the packet uh, that uh, this amount of compensation of $180,000 um, was actually worked out uh, as proper with one of the residents who then later changed their mind. Uh, Dale, is that correct? Mayor Bagley and Councilmember Martin, uh, that's correct. We received an email from Holly Martin, uh, Holly Cook, excuse me, not Martin, Holly Cook, um, earlier this year, uh, stating that $180,000 um, was um, what was needed or adequate to fully mitigate the impacts of the road hauling on her and her project and her property. So there was a letter saying no, Pay us 180,000, Boulder County said aggregate pay it. They paid it and we're here. Okay. Mayor Bagley, it hasn't been paid yet. No, um, no, my, yeah. my point is they're willing, they're going to pay it if we proceed. Correct. Correct. Okay. Joan, or sorry, Councilor Beck. Mayor, if I might jump in for just a moment, pardon me, sorry. Sure. Uh -huh. We do have still a couple callers uh, for public comment on this item. There's oh yeah, one we, more. Not, we have not closed the public Okay. Hearing. Just don't want to miss those. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Councilor Peck. So my question about the uh, 180,000 is there, there is no non-disclosure agreement or uh, agreement that they can never complain about this road. 
again if they uh, if they accept that money? It's not a buyout, is it? Mayor Bagley and Council Member Peck, there is a requirement in the agreements that they would uh, sign a waiver to not sue or take further litigation against aggregate, the county, or the city of Longmont. Okay. But they can, if there's issues and they're concerned with it, they can still communicate because that's part of the agreement with the county is resolving those issues if they come into play in, in it too. So it doesn't eliminate them bringing issues to the attention of the county and the city. Oh, good. That's what I wanted to know, to make sure that, that they weren't just shut out completely. Right. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, did you raise your hand? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, my question is, uh, before the, the Costco project came online, obviously we know this land was, was slated to be mined. Uh, was Quilk Silver considered to be the route at that point as well? Uh, Mayor Bagley and, and Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, um, what the haul route said on the approved mining plan that was approved by both Boulder County as well as the state, um, it did not eliminate Quicksilver Road, but it did not designate it as the route either. What it said was that um, truck traffic from the point where it enters 119th Street could not go south. It needed to go north. And so um, it, it, it did not limit it, uh, prevent Quicksilver. However, Quicksilver um, currently has a weight, weight limit on it from Boulder County that is also being um, removed as part of the agreement, again, between the city and the county um, that would then allow Quicksilver Road to be a haul route. So essentially it was not designated, but was never fully say taken off the table of options. Correct. And, and noting the, what the city staff has said about efficiency of, of movement of the trucks, that would likely have been explored anyway for the general uh, mining operations that were to take place before we had changed, before the uh, Costco project came on board. That, that and to, to be clear, to Dale's point, back to 2018, we had been communicating with the county that we did not like the idea of putting 300 trucks at the intersection of 119 and Ken Pratt because of the safety issues associated with it and what we've seen at other intersections in terms of wrecks at high speeds on those roads. And so we, we had been communicating with the council or with the county that we didn't like the idea of all the movements that were occurring at an unsignalized intersection. Okay, so that brings me to a second point, I guess, in the sense that as we brought up, um, objections to the use of Highway 119 for these trucks. Uh, that didn't necessarily mean that they weren't going to use Highway 119. It's just that's the city's objection to it. Similar to this uh, concept of the use of Quicksilver as these resident, the resident as well as property owners object to it, but cannot necessarily prohibit the use of the road. Similar as we probably couldn't prohibit trucks from using Highway 119 we can just uh, state objection and hope for a favorable decision. Is I that accurate? I believe that's correct, that's correct Mayor Pro Tem. All right, uh, that's it for now, thank you. All right, let's continue then with the public invited, or sorry, the public hearing on this matter. How many more callers do we have? Mayor, there's two callers. Give me just a moment here. We are working on reviving our live stream. Okay. Looks like we're back online. Um, caller ending in 479. 479. You should be able to unmute yourself and state your name and address and you have three minutes. Yes, I would like to uh, beg councils uh, yeah, I'd like to beg council's uh, 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 pardon and that I may.
Sir, we're having a hard time hearing you again. You begged our pardon and then you went away. Caller 479, can you unmute yourself again and uh, give it another shot? Can you hear me? We yes, can we hear can. you now. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to beg counsel's pardon, and I may have jumped the gun earlier in the first call. Michael Hannon, uh, attorney, 16495 Gray's Way, Broomfield, Colorado. And I would like to add on uh, to Ms. Cook's statement. Uh, Uh, sir, we lost you again. Um, what I'm going to do, though, you're, feel, you're free to continue to try, try but um, for the record, I'm going to go ahead and make a note. If you could put in the notes uh, this particular caller, I believe he made the comments during the, the first call public invited to be heard. Could you make an, a, a note in the notes um, to go back? and refer to his comments. Okay, I, am I back now? You're back now, yep. Let's try it one more time, but we're gonna go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. The, one, the, I can't. No, what I was gonna say is before you start, the comments that you made at the beginning of the meeting, I'm instructing our, our clerk to make a reference saying that your comments in the beginning need to be added here so that it's part of the public okay. record, okay? But Thank go ahead, you. you've got your Thank you minutes. so much. Let's try again. Okay, uh, I don't really I don't even need all the three minutes, but the bottom line is that uh, uh, I'd like to add on to the issue of this hundred and eighty thousand dollars that that was never, at least in my letters, never offered as a settlement uh, for aggregate to go forward with this. Uh, in fact, I specifically stated there were other concerns that that would not cover. And I also included Mr. Rademacher. I also sent letters to the uh, attorney for aggregate that uh, the uh, offer was not an offer and should not be considered an offer in any way because of these other considerations. And uh, let's see. And again, this issue of the notice, uh, Ms. Holly Cook did state, I believe correctly, that she accidentally found out because the discussion was made with the neighbor and not her. We believe that adequate notice has not been yet officially provided for this project and uh, therefore should not go forward and should not be approved at tonight's meeting until that has been further investigated. Uh, with respect to anything else that I might add, I think Ms. Cook uh, did a pretty good job in, in stating what her objections were. And I would again appreciate the letter of October 8th being entered into tonight's meeting on the record. I think it fully explains our position on this matter. And that being said, I thank the council for hearing me. And again, uh, certainly thank them for their concerns over health and the environment. And uh, I do think that the letter will fully explain that uh, this 180,000, by the way, if you read it in that agreement, what I say the Lord giveth, sometimes the Lord taketh away, because right in the paragraph just below that 180,000, it basically says if that money is not available or budgeted, then all the parties are relieved from their obligations. So that clause with respect to the 180,000 could become very meaningless, and therefore I think needs further investigation as well. With that being said, I thank counsel for uh, it's uh, listening and uh, will certainly uh, impose upon them to please not pass this resolution or this uh, amendment to the uh, original uh, use of this property or this road and uh, not do it until there's further investigation into this matter. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. So just out of curiosity, do we have a copy of that letter? You have it? All right. We have it. We, we're, can we're, it in the, we can enter it into the record. Which which letter? The He said that his October 8th letter that he sent to the city. I think he's also sent the same letter to the council members. You all have received that. Right, but can we so, make sure that it just gets put into the minutes tonight as part of the public hearing? Correct. Let me forward that to... 
Yeah, I will forward that to Don to be included in the in the record. Okay, great. All right, next caller. All right, the final caller that we have here is ending in 633. Guest 633. You should be able to unmute yourself. Guest 633, are you able to join us? Star six to unmute. Hi, hello. Hello, we can hear you. Go ahead and state your name and address and you have three minutes. Oh, Marianne Rigai. Um, I'm at 70 21st Avenue. Uh, Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments in Longmont. Um, I didn't know I'd be asked to speak so soon. <laughs> so it's only five to 10, but <laughs> anyway, um, um, I'd like to bring up, if I may, um, what was discussed at the beginning of the, well, near the beginning of the meeting about the um, uh, map, the um, virus uh, spreading in um, uh, Boulder County and Boulder and Longmont and all the towns apparently here in Boulder County. Um, the issue for, Mar 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 Marianne, yes. I'm gonna have to ask yes. you to call back at the end of the meeting. Uh, okay, right, I don't right know now. why she, um, I, I don't know why she asked me to speak now, so I apologize. That, that, that's I right, apologize the, 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 the only reason I'm doing that is I don't want to begin, um, we'd love to hear mm -hmm. from you, we always love to hear from you, but if we, if we allow oh, thank this. You. I just want to make sure okay. that we don't have people starting to call in to try to cheat uh, the system right. by addressing their other concerns when we're, we're talking. No, that wasn't my intent. Cost. I wasn't I, sure I know. why. We, Marianne, you're, you're yeah, awesome. We yeah. love hearing from you. But if you could call back oh, thank and you. last call public invited to be heard, that would be awesome. Okay. Alrighty. I will. Thank you so much. All right. Mayor. Thanks, thank Mr. You. Guy. Um, All right. Bye-bye. Mm, All right. Bye-bye. Okay. So any other debate as we... We'll just go, uh, Mayor with him. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, just actually, first, a uh, uh, clarification since we have to take these one at a time, in essence, uh, would you like our comments to be specific to each one, or would, would let's, you like let's, us? Let's, let's just go, let's just go one at a time, and then okay. if, if somebody has an issue about that specific one, my, my bigger, my overall concern as okay. we get going is, uh, Dale, uh, can you, my, my question is. Are we going to, if we approve all but one, is it going to screw everything up? Uh, the answer is yes. And then the next question I have as we proceed forward, is there any chance whatsoever that we need to go back and give notice? And if we do have to go back and give notice to start the process over in order to comply with the law, I what do we do? I would rather have Eugene address yeah. that. Eugene? Mayor and Council, Eugene May, uh, City Attorney. Uh, I'm unaware of any notice. This is an IGA with uh, Boulder County and an agreement with Aggregate Industries. These are properties that aren't in the city of Longmont. These are Boulder County properties with a Boulder County road. I don't know any obligation that the city would have to provide property owners notice. Okay, so that's a, this is a Boulder, so rightfully, so what they should go to Boulder County and discuss this issue with them if there's notice. That's what Correct. I'm hearing? Okay, all right. Let's go ahead, Council Member Peck. So just so as we vote on these, just so I understand, this is only an IGA for maintenance of this road and it is not for use of the road. Is that correct? Mayor, Mayor Bagley and Councilmember Peck, I would describe it as it, it is an IGA that is being uh, entered into with the county uh, contemplating the use of the road um, as the haul route for the money. And, and I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the underlying um, outcome of it. It includes the uh, various mitigation efforts to address uh, any impacts that, that might result from that use of hauling for that interim time while the mining is occurring. Okay. So if I can kind of help on this, it is a Boulder County road that is open to use by the public. Because of the weight limit issue, Boulder County 
had to authorize the use of the road. And in authorizing the use of the road, they said, here's what we want you to do and what to look at in order for us to let you use the road. So the IGA is with Boulder County allowing aggregate industries to utilize the road of which the county commissioners approved this morning. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. My, my comments actually are specific right now to uh, Ordinance 2020-62, the first item uh, underneath the Costco list. And it was that we received obviously various emails and have been receiving various emails from the folks in Harvest Junction. Uh, one email characterized my comments the other week as trying to guarantee some sort of specific greenway buffering uh, between the neighborhoods and the development. That wasn't the uh, impetus behind my comments. It, my comments are really that this process is so early that we can't make any sort of judgments or, or guarantees based on that because it has not truly gone through the development process that the city has. And that's why I made the comments I did is that it will go through that, that city process. It will have the time to have commu you know, community meetings uh, between the developers and the community and our city staff and for there to be comments and to be input about greenways and, and parks and the siting of things as well as with the affordable, the proposed affordable housing the city is taking on. That's obviously even closer to the vest for us as the city in the sense that we have much more control over the design as well as the process of that because we are the, the property owners as the city. Um, and so there'll be a lot of opportunity for the community at Harvest Junction to weigh in and to give their input uh, for both developments um, because they are separate. Not to mention, obviously, the, the pieces that the Goldens are, are retaining. So all of those things will have to go through our development process, which is, is a ways down, you know, down the road, as I think was indicated by the timeline, where we're not even expecting this thing to be fully constructed until, I think I heard, 2022 at this point. Uh, I think that was one projection that was set. So I just wanted to clarify that I'm not guaranteeing parks and greenways, I'm just guaranteeing input will, there'll be plenty of opportunity for input by the community. Great That's points, all. great points, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Uh, Council Mayor Martin. Yeah, I'd also like to, 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 to talk about that because um, what I think the Mayor Pro Tem can guarantee, what we all can guarantee is that the same process that any other building project uh, gets in terms of land use, planning, zoning, um, and approval will be applied in this case. So we're not absolving Costco of having to meet our building codes, our land use codes, our, the, the obligation to uh, conduct public hearings. All that is still in the future. And, um, you know, when there is uncommitted land in in at any point um, adjacent to your property, um, those processes can apply to the land adjacent to your property. And that's just the way it is. All right, uh, let's go ahead then and run through some ordinances. All right, let's start with uh, 10D1, ordinance 2020. We'll go ahead and close the public hearing for uh, item 10D. Let's go ahead and uh, run through the run through each one. Uh, so, 10D1, Ordinance 2020-62, built for an ordinance approving a pu public-private partnership agreement among Diamond G Concrete Company, Costco Wholesale Corporation, and the City of Longmont in furtherance of development of a Costco membership warehouse. I'll move approval of Ordinance 2020-62. Well, where, where, warehouse facility, affordable housing, and additional commercial retail uses. We have a motion by Dr. Waters. We have a second by Councilmember Christensen, or was that Councilmember Beck? No, doesn't matter. All right, we'll go with Councilmember Christensen. All right, seeing no further debate or discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ordinance 2020-62 passes unanimously. All right, uh, item 10D2, Ordinance 2020-63, a bill for an ordinance amending Title IV of the Longmont Municipal Code on Revenue and Finance by creating the Harvest Junction East Special Revenue Fund 
Do we have a motion? I will, I will, Councilmember Martin? Yeah, I'll move uh, 2020-63. That's so I guess moved, moved by Doc, uh, by, uh, Doc Martin, <laughs> moved by Councilmember Martin, and it was seconded, I think, by Councilmember Peck by a wave of her hand first, but with all due respect, Dr. Waters. So we'll go ahead, and all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Aye. All right, Ordinance 2020-63 passes unanimously. Item 10D3, Ordinance 2020-64, built for an ordinance making additional appropriations for expenses and liabilities to the city of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2020. Do we have a motion, Dr. Waters? I'll move a, I'll move, hang on a second. I'll move approval of Ordinance 2020-64. I'll second. All right, it was moved by Dr. Waters, seconded by uh, Council Member Doggo Faring. All in favor of Ordinance 2020-64, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, Ordinance 2020-64 passes unanimously. Item 10D4, Resolution 2020-130, a resolution to Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Boulder County concerning use, maintenance, and repair of Quicksilver Road. Um, uh, do we have a motion? I'll move approval. I, I'll second that. So it was moved by Dr. Waters, seconded by myself. All in favor of Resolution 2020-130, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, resolution 2020-130 passes unanimously. Uh, item 10D5, resolution 2020-131, a resolution along of the Longmont City Council approving an agreement and revocable permit with Aggregate Industries, WCR Inc. for maintenance of Quicksilver Road and access to North 119th Street. Do we have a motion? I will move resolution 2020-131. Second. Second. Uh, was moved by myself and seconded by Council Mayor Martin. All in favor of resolution 2020-131, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Resolution 2020-131 passes unanimously. And then finally, 10D6, resolution 2020-132, a resolution to Longmont City Council authorizing loans from fund balance in the city's fleet fund to the Harvest Junction East Special Revenue Fund and the Affordable Housing Fund and providing for repayment of the loans from the Harvest Junction East Special Revenue Fund and the Affordable Housing Fund. Council Member Christensen. I move 2020 All second. It was moved by Council Member Christensen. It was second by Council Member Yall, Council Member Yaga Faring. All in favor of resolution 2020-132, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, resolution 2020-132 passes unanimously. We've got no items removed from the consent agenda. Let's move on to general business. Harold, the time is yours to discuss a long lot waste services. Council Member Christensen. We removed item D. Yeah, but or they, we removed it. We removed it from. For, did we remove it from discussion tonight? Did we not? Staff removed it completely. No, Mayor. That was uh, item D on general business. Item D on consent was removed by Councilmember Martin. Ah, okay. We'll go ahead. And I was I was under the I got those confused. So D oh. is back on the books. So let's go ahead and proceed, Councilmember Martin and Councilmember Christensen. What do you want to talk about with number D? Um, what I didn't move any remove anything from the consent agenda. I I asked that that ah okay, Councilmember Christensen. Oh, I think D did get removed. It did get removed. So yeah. So do we want to do we want to discuss this or yes? Okay, go ahead, Councilmember Christensen. Okay. Um, well, um, we all got a copy of the uh, environmental report, which uh, Joan Peck, Councilman Peck, um, asked for. And uh, I find this really very interesting. I'm looking at the summary, and there are many, many, I'm, I'm looking at pages four through six on this summary from 1950. 2015, March of 2015. Um, and there are nine uh, recommendations or nine summary items. And uh, I'm not going to read them all because I'm not going to, but I, I, I assume that most of you read them. And it worries me because I don't know who's going to be sure that, you know, this. Um, was passed the Planning and Zoning Board conditional upon them with the condition that they do some, that they have an environmental report and that they do some mitigation. 
I'm wondering who's going to be sure that they do this because there are very serious problems uh, having to do with, um, it says here, we believe these concerns can be, there, the site presents challenges for the plan development. The geotechnical concerns include undocumented compressed fill, shallow groundwater erosion, and scour. We believe these concerns can be mitigated with proper planning, engineering, design, and construction. Um, concerns associated with existing fill may influence land use. So there are a number of very serious things having to do with uh, flood potential, groundwater, because it used to be a lake, <laughs> and, um, landfill, which is going to cause subsidence. These are, you know, we, I think this is going to be a very good development, or it could be a very good development. I'm worried about the people who are buying into this development, though. We want what is built here to be good quality and not cause problems for homeowners. If there is, they're talking about three uh, to three and a half inches of potential sediment for new fill heights of six feet with no building loads. Um, but when you put a building load over that, um, they're suggesting that they need to have either deep foundations anchored in bedrock or shallow foundations after fill removal um, and suggesting under drain systems. I mean, this is, you know, very challenging and I'm sure that the people building this know that, but I'm just, I want to make sure that somebody is going to be monitoring this mitigation and that we're not going to be building stuff that's going to start sinking leaking, uh, causing all kinds of problems. And also once they start working on building this, leaking, leaching um, things into the ground, into the river that are uh, toxic or damaging to the, <laughs> to the um, wildlife there, uh, both at the site and further down the site. Cause you know, it's, a beautiful river. So um, I'm wondering who's going to who's going to be sure that this stuff actually does get mitigated in the way that it's suggested by this uh, RMCS report. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Eva Pehajewski, Planning and Development Services. Uh, we're processing the annexation entitlement application. Uh, with our team tonight, we have uh, Chris Huffer from Public Works, who reviewed the environmental reports, as well as Josh Sherman, who is the project manager for the Resilient St. Rain Project. Um, we also have um, the applicant and the property owner here, David Starnes and David Waldner here as well to answer any questions you may have. But in general, your general question is who will over make sure that these are taken care of? Certainly that's the, that's the purpose of our public works and our building safety department in plan review. Um, again, this is not a development application, it's annexation. So um, at the time of development application, they would be required to give us a brand new geotech report, update their environmental reports, and our public works engineers would ensure that all of the buildings and all of the design uh, meet city standards and don't harm the environment. Um, certainly, Chris is here. He's reviewed some of the environmental reports. Uh, again, Josh is here if you have any questions about uh, the Resilient St. Brain Project. Polly, does that answer your questions enough? Well, so given that this was a lake, because, you know, what's left of it is uh, Isaac Walton Pond, um, uh, and that there's a lot of uncompressed fill, uh, which is true all up and down the river. It was you know, for years, just a dumping ground. That's the way people thought about rivers. <laughs> but um, how far down is the bedrock if people want to build on that? How far down is the bedrock? Because that could be extremely expensive if they have to go all the way down to bedrock to build a foundation. Uh, mayors and members of council, Chris Hopper with uh, Public Works Engineering. Mm -hmm. um, to try and answer your question, uh, the geotech report indicates that bedrock is somewhere uh, between eight and 15 feet uh, oh, below the surface now. Um, 
in that uh, this is not necessarily an unusual uh, event, as you in indicated. Um, but uh, as we move forward with the development, yes, we'll certainly be looking for, uh, as Ava indicated, a, a new geotech report with uh, um, more specific recommendations for how they'll address these okay. issues. Um, and it'll be up to the developer to decide if they're going to over excavate and remove a lot of that material and build it back up, or if they're right. going to try and put piers down to, to bedrock, as he indicated. Um, and so, and um, oh, go ahead. well, we did a lot of uh, a lot of flood mitigation all along there after the report came out, or I don't know whether it was after 215 or before, because it was around 213 that the flood came. Um, so are we comfortable with the, um, the flood mitigation study and, uh, the flood mitigation work that we've done, which will now be maybe somewhat disturbed by any new development there? Uh, so, so, uh, go ahead, Harold, sorry. <laughs> no. I'll, I'll let Dale. So the, the only work we've done in that location is actually sunset as we're moving okay. up. Oh. For the We've got to move up with the project, and so Isaac Walton is actually the area that we're working on with the Army Corps, and then the yeah. next phase is where we get into that piece, and that's what Josh is Oh, okay. For. Okay. So we just right. did, worked around the bridge. Okay. Is that it, Dale? Did I get it? Yeah, I'm trying to not drag this further, but that is correct. The... Um, and the uh, Army Corps is, is certainly aware of, of, of any potential issue. Their final design will take that into account, uh, which they're uh, getting underway with at this point. Um, I also recall, uh, and I believe within the last year or so, that additional um, on-site geotech uh, explorations were done um, based on some questions that we all had at that time as well. Um, and am I correct on that, uh, Ava and Chris? Sorry, can you say that again, Dale? I believe last year or so when we had questions about the pending annexation, um, Public Works uh, requested that, it, that the uh, developer conduct additional on-site uh, geotech uh, borings um, in order to ascertain whether or not um, there was any potential for uh, uh, contamination or other issues uh, within the area. And um, I, I was the official that Ruby Bowman met with, and I did provide her the information that showed that this property had been previously mined and obviously subsequently refilled. Um, but I, I'm trying to remember if that if I'm remembering that correctly. Chris? Yes, um, th there was uh, some additional work done. I can't remember exactly when it occurred, um, but there were additional borings that were out there that confirmed um, the assertion that uh, the site has been filled with uh, sand and uh, rubble material or uh, used or it's, um, uh, used concrete. Um, and so in looking at that report, th that confirmed that they had not found any uh, landfill type material other than the sand and gravel and uh, th that type of material at that point in time. And it was consistent with the uh, uh, assertion of it being a pond at one point in time being higher at uh, both ends and lower in the middle. Um, and that's what we looked at that, at that point in time. Thanks, Chris. That, that, that was what I recalled. All right, we're going to go with Councilmember Martin. And are we close to having our well, I guess we have a lot of questions. Councilmember Martin and Councilmember Waters and Councilmember Eli Lopez and Councilmember Peck. And I was Mayor not my hand. I was just restraining my cat. Well, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Waters. Uh, the eastern edge of this property, obviously, it, it is along the same brain. Um, well, how is it classified in our red, yellow, green, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, tiers or categories with respect to the SES? My assumption is that would be red. Uh, David Bell could probably respond to that, uh, Council Member Waters. 
or Don. Good evening, Mayor Bagley, uh, Councilmember Waters, Don Burchett, Planning Manager. So the uh, St. Vrain River is all identified as green on our maps. So I turned it around, and Don, I'm sorry. I, it was in the category where we would we would be applying the 150 foot setback. This this falls over. into that that this falls into the hundred. Yeah, I, I, I flipped I flipped our color code. I apologize. That's okay. Um, and so, if there were any variances needed with the development of this property, it would fall under the SES, and City Council would be the decision maker on any variances for nonconformance to the standards. Has there any, been any discussion about the donation from the property owner, the donation of that 150 foot setback to the city? I am not aware of any council member waters. Um, I know that as part of our development review, we typically look at getting our minimum dedications for the greenway that are required by the land development code to be given to the city when they plat the property. Um, but I'm not aware of specific negotiations, Ava or the public work staff maybe, but I, I, I am not. And any of that, um, as you go through that process, uh, in terms of the, what would be donated to the city to maintain the greenways, would this fall into, into that, uh, not, I guess, provision or, or consideration? So, Mayor... Bagley Councilmember Waters, as part of the annexation, typically on the concept plan, we identify the areas that are going to be dedicated to the city. Uh, the Greenway is one of those areas. We would be identifying typically the width of that that would be given to the city by code. And then at time of platting, we would solidify the design and the dimensions of that property that are going to be dedicated to the city as open space for the Greenway. Um, again, I'm not aware of uh, specifically what that distance is, Ava May. Uh, yes, thank you, Don. Uh, Mayor and council members, council member Waters. Uh, there is a note on the concept plan that does say that they have to provide the 150 foot greenway buffer. So that is a note on the concept plan. And then if this were annexed and they come in with a development application, that is where we would fine tune the details of that uh, land area and the dedication on the plat. Do you consider that then a don't uh, that they would be required to donate that 150 that whatever that whatever the footage is obviously the 150 foot but to comply with uh, what we need for greenways? Yes, we call it a dedication, but it's same thing. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Who is next? Councilmember Douglas Faring. Mayor uh, actually is uh, Councilmember Peck, and then Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I, I do have a couple of questions, but um, I just want to state that I thought that the environmental study in 2015 was very fun reading. Um, they didn't really inspect the land. They just stared at it from uh, outside a fence and then anecdotally asked other people what they thought of it. And I, it, I thought it was surprising that nobody asked the Golden family about that lake and, and their drilling operations. So that was quite fun reading. Um, and I do want to thank Justin McClure for at least in his presentation, he gave aerial maps so that you could actually see the lake. Um, so my other, my one question is that the city purchased a portion of that land. Is that correct? So was that, was that purchase for the resilient St. Vrain, St. Vrain uh, construction or remediation? whatever you want to call it, or was it um, well to comply with the fact that an annexation has to uh, abut city property? Uh, Council Member Peck, it was uh, specifically for the Resilient St. Rain project uh, because we had critical timelines for getting our funding from FEMA. And um, I believe Josh can answer those questions specifically. Uh, but we, they were in a time crunch, so the city had to acquire that piece, yes, and okay. that was for RSV. All right, uh, that's what I wanted to know. I do have concerns, number one, uh, that we do not have a concept plan with this annexation, and the reason is the very first public meeting that I went to, there was a concept plan with a 
with a restaurant near uh, Saint, with, near the St. Vrain and some work, uh, work I'm, I'm losing my thought process, some residents, uh, et cetera. Where is that, where is that uh, plan? Are they going to continue with that concept plan? Is there gonna be a different one? And is the reason I'm asking is because I'm concerned about the uh, scour risk and the erosion. As we've learned, or as I've learned from the 2013 flood that water always goes back to its original, uh, original course. So if we're having underground flooding, it's gonna go back to that same rain and how will that work with the scour and erosion? I mean, just looking forward. So council member Peck, uh, mayor and council members. So what happened was initially uh, an application came in for this property for annexation. And it, you're correct, uh, it, it did have a concept plan with just slightly some more detail of a mixed use project. That application was withdrawn uh, and the applicant uh, took that away and then they restarted the application process again. And when they reapplied for annexation the second time, uh, they did have a more generalized concept plan that did not have a site, specific site plan laid out on it. Um, and that is very typical. It's not required by code to have a specific site plan in your concept plan. Um, and that's pretty typical for annexations where they just come in and they say, we'd like to zone the property this, consistent with whatever is in our comprehensive plan and envision Longmont. And then once it's annexed in, um, they, they play around with it, try and figure out what the market drive is for that property, what's the highest and best use, and that's where they come up with site plans. Uh, so that you are correct, you saw something a long time ago, but that concept plan was withdrawn. This application was then resubmitted as a brand new application, and the concept plan uh, was left more generalized and vague, didn't have a specific site plan to it. The traffic okay. study did contemplate Oh, I'd have to pull it up. It was in your packet, uh, but it contemplated um, a mix of retail, office, flex office, uh, things that are allowed in the mixed use employment zone. So I just want to say I, I totally agree that this needs to be developed. And um, I, I understand the zoning through Envision Longmont, but just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So uh, I'm very concerned about if there is uh, residential development that it is taken into effect that this scour and erosion is there and we don't put people in a uh, in an untenable position when we are going to have another flood. Um, the other thing and this is this isn't really important but I caught it is that um, in the documentation uh, it was stated that it, it was it met Envision Longmont's uh, transportation multimodal plan that BRT on 119 was going to go down Bowen, I mean Boston to Bowen, uh, but there won't be any stops on Boston. It's it's a regional, it is not a local bus route, and they're just going down Boston to get to First Avenue to get to our station. So that that's really not a, a multimodal for residents. That might happen in 2040 or possibly when we get our train, they'll do that together. But um, I think that's important. So thanks. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I'm sure probably some of my other colleagues on council have also met with Mr. McClure, but for you know full disclosure, I've met with Mr. McClure a little over a year ago, I believe. Um, and I will say a couple things that stood out to me is he's got a lot of energy. Um, and in my conversation with him, I definitely conveyed the fact that the riparian area, the, the St. Vrain, is a sensitive area to many people in the city. And that anything he would do would have a lot of uh, resident comments on it and input from folks. And he seemed very amenable to it, which I appreciate. Uh, he said he was willing to at least with his conversation with me, meet with anybody that was part of the the you know organized group, much less any other residents that are concerned with the St. Vrain and anything developed along those lines. Uh, but the other thing that stood out to me was 
it seemed like he had a real passion for, as he termed it, horizontal infrastructure. Um, and that would be everything that people are really concerned about as far as foundations and, and how the soils and the, and, and the fill is for the site and things along those. And if you look at some of his uh, other projects, he did take on notably hard to develop sites and did them successfully in say Louisville and other places in the Carbon Valley. Um, so I don't, I don't doubt his expertise or his ability to hire the right people to adequately develop uh, infrastructure on a difficult site. I know he has a lot of ideas which we may disagree or agree about as far as how to finance those kinds of uh, improvements. But at the same time, I don't doubt his ability to do it in, in a, a sustainable way that is also respectful of the environment. Um, outside of that, as I think has been noted, we are talking about an annexation. And in this case, this annexation happens to be an enclave within our city, which I think are more important to get annexed into city limits than say some of our uh, outlying pieces of, of, of property that are not uh, yet in the footprint for the city, but lie on our outskirts of town. So I, I definitely would be um, supportive of this annexation request specifically because it is an enclave. And I, I generally, and have stated this many times, and more for the city of Longmont having control over these properties as far as regulation in development than allowing our counterparts, which I have no qualms with, but allowing our counterparts in Boulder County to choose what goes within our city, essentially. So I, I will support this annexation. Okay, I'm hoping we can go ahead and, all right, Council Martin. I'm, I move uh, ordinance 2021-01. Uh, second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, ordinance 2021-01 passes unanimously. And I was removed forever, not forever, just tonight, right? City staff? Yeah, I was removed until January 5th, not July 5th, January 5th. Okay, all right. And we'll need to convert January 5th into a regular meeting. All right, can we do that or do you need a motion? Just do it, right? Well, do it if we time. need a motion, we'll let you know, but I all think right. we can do it. All right. So it's currently we'll 1030. I'm, 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 I'm in a great mood, but I am getting tired. So let's go to 12A, Longmont Waste Services Program Review. Bob, you got this? Yeah. Erica, you're, I assume, pulling our slides up. Nice beard. <laughs> the sage. There we go. All right, thanks. So mayor, members of Longmont City Council, I'm Bob Allen, Director of Operations in Public Works and Natural Resources. And I'm here tonight to talk about our waste services program. I've got a presentation that's fairly brief. I'll try to bang through it. I do wanna start out and say that um, I'd like to acknowledge the men and women that work in waste services. They've had a pretty challenging year this year with the pandemic. Uh, a lot more people at home generating a lot more trash, a lot more cars parked around residential neighborhoods they have to navigate. And they've actually done an ex excellent job and put in a lot of hours doing it this year. Um, also like to acknowledge uh, Charles Caminides. He's your waste services guru. Um, Charlie's very passionate. Um, it's great to work with. Um, he, he spends a lot of time talking to residents, stakeholders, and uh, community groups, and uh, he's a real resource asset to the city and um, wanted to acknowledge him for that. Next slide, or first slide. So I um, wa want to really cover four things here tonight. I'd like to give you a very quick and brief overview of the program. Um, talk about some key indicators that we have talked about before. Um, talk a little bit about some of the, the uh, potential future for some of our key services, and then have some discussion and uh, hopefully get some direction on uh, how we proceed tonight or after tonight. So um, next slide.
Our waste services program is guided um, substantially by our sustainability plan. Um, in effect, um, that plan and the goal for that plan is to divert waste from landfills. And overall, we'd like to see 50% uh, residential waste diversion by 2025. I am not here tonight to have a presentation about the environmental impacts of solid waste that is not um, diverted away from landfills, but I think those are well documented. I think those who spoke earlier um, tonight, the community members and stakeholders did a really good job of articulating some of those concerns. Um, I thought that video that uh, Molly Briggs played was, uh, was good, entertaining, and, and really hit on some of the key issues of greenhouse gas emissions and um, the problems associated with you know, creating virgin materials for products without recycling. Um, so I thought they did a good job with that. Um, obviously you can, uh, reasonable people can debate the urgency and um, um, you know, some of the, uh, the level of the problem, but um, I thought that that was, um, was not uh, um, over or understated and they did a good job with that. Next slide. Uh, one of the projects that we did recently take on that has a, a net benefit to the city and the environment is the conversion of about half of our solid waste fleet over to um, compressed natural gas. It, it, we're in effect using uh, the gas now that comes from the uh, wastewater treatment plant that we had, uh, previously had to flame off that we weren't using and, um, and moved away from using diesel. We hope to convert in by 2024 to convert that fleet over fully. Um, but a good, a good project. And if you have any questions about that later, I have the project manager, John Gage on with us tonight too, and he can uh, certainly help or answer any questions. Next slide. So I wanna start just showing um, what we have heard most commonly from all sources, stakeholders, community members, other staff members, um, about um, the future of the program. Um, we have heard, and I'm not here advocating tonight, that's not my role. Um, it's to help facilitate this discussion so that you can give us policy direction. But the three things we've most commonly heard is um, a desire to enhance or expand participation in residential composting, um, the implementation or adoption of a universal recycling ordinance of some kind, and uh, better options, uh, particularly nearby for hard to recycle items in the community. So keep those in mind as we work through this and we can certainly circle back to discussion on those and other topics. Next slide. Um, quick background on the program. Uh, Longmont Trash was municipalized in 1948. Um, up until about 1992, we were hauling waste to a city-owned landfill, uh, cheap and easy, that, that closed at that time, and now we haul waste to the Front Range landfill. Um, sometime around that time, I don't know exactly when recycling began in Longmont. Um, EcoCycle was instrumental in helping the community develop that. I think it started with some really simple options of uh, setting, you know, melt crates to the curb with newspapers and aluminum in it and progress to a multi-stream recycling options uh, and carts to a single stream option in 2010. Um, in 2017, we added a voluntary curbside composting program. And in 2017, uh, when we adopted pay-as-you-throw rates or more aggressive pay-as-you-throw rates, we adopted also the first every other week trash um, option in, that we're, we're aware of in Colorado. Next slide. Uh, the primary services, obviously our core services, which are curbside trash and recycle, and then the operation of the Waste Diversion Center. Um, as I mentioned, the voluntary composting program, um, some a la carte services for large item uh, collection on request and uh, dumpster rentals. Next slide, please. Supplemental services, um, I think most of you are aware of these. Um, they range from paper shredding to some holiday recycling events. Um, our popular leaf, uh, fall leaf and spring branch collection programs, uh, household hazardous waste, 
uh, zero waste for city events, um, a few little ad hoc things along with these from time to time, but these are the core ones. Next slide. Our, um, despite some of the concerns that it's not easy to recycle some hard to recycle items in Longmont, we actually do have options for quite a few different things um, at our waste diversion center. In addition to the single stream, you can drop off their cardboard, uh, shredded paper. Uh, we also take styrofoam, plastic bags, motor oils, um, batteries, bulky metals. Um, the main operation there is the uh, tree limb reception and grinding, and then we will provide mulch back to our residents at no cost. Next slide. Uh, our current rates, um, I know most of you have seen these, uh, you all pay these. Um, the goal here was to have about um, double the cost for double the size. So you'll see that in the rate structure. And um, as pointed out, I think by uh, somebody who called in earlier tonight, you can also rent an extra large or small container. And, um, and of course the optional composting. Next slide, please. City also charges a waste management fee. It's uh, 296 per month per resident. Um, it generates about 1 million annually. Um, that fee is used for waste collection, you know, for government operations and facilities. So parks and recreation, um, city facilities, illegal dumping, um, encampments along the river that we clean up, um, downtown uh, trash and recycle, that's from First Avenue up to Long's Peak. Um, City-sponsored events, uh, we use it for outreach and education and some of our sustainability work um, that's solid waste related. Um, one thing that I will mention here is there are restrictions, legal restrictions on how this money can be used. So we can use it for, um, you know, government properties and government programs, but we can't use it to subsidize programs that are provided uh, by private haulers. So in other words, we couldn't collect this money um, and use it to subsidize the cost of a composting program, a curbside recycling uh, or composting program. Uh, we, that would be a restriction on the use of that fee. Next slide, please. The pay-as-you-throw rate structure um, was implemented in 2017. Um, at that time, uh, or before that, you paid about 50% more for double capacity. Um, that rate is up to about 90% more now for double capacity. Uh, next slide, please. So the impact of that, this is the distribution of uh, the two cart sizes in 2016. And prior to pay as you throw, we had about 80% participation or subscription to the 96 gallon. Next slide, please. When we uh, met with you back in April of 2018, um, we showed you these metrics and that number had um, dropped from 79% down to 65% for the 96 gallon container and our every other week uh, subscription was up at 7% at that time, also an increase in 48 gallon subscription. Next slide, please. Um, as of September of 2020, we're at about 58% participation in the 96 gallon uh, container and up to 10% in the every other week. The, the goal with the pay as you throw rates um, when we set them with our consultant was about 50% subscription in the long term in the 96 gallon. I expect in two or three years we'll probably be there. Next slide, please. In 2018, after about a year of um, the voluntary composting program, we presented to you that we had 14% participation. And next slide, please. Next, next slide. Hmm. I think we skipped over um, what- Were what? you missing the 21% um, 
the slides yeah. look remarkably similar. So 14% in March of 2018 and 21% in September, 2020? Yes, yes. They, they look very close. Yes, sorry. Um, so we're up at, um, as of September, up to 21%. Next slide, please. So municipal waste diversion, um, waste diversion for our residential waste at the curb is about 26%. Um, that's a solid number. Um, that's still, you know, in, in many respects, relatively low. Um, probably, you know, anywhere from 50 to 75 percent of uh, what is set out at the curb uh, can fairly easily be recycled. So um, it's a good solid number. When you include, include the um, diversion at the waste diversion center, that jump, jumps up to about 35 to 40 percent diversion. Um, so solid diversion rates, and they're really uh, very solid for Colorado, which is, uh, was mentioned earlier tonight, has a relatively low rate um, in the U.S., uh, but uh, Longmont's doing a good job, but there is a lot of room there for improvement. Um, total waste diversion is unknown. Um, we do have pri private hauler reporting that is improving. Um, we don't really know how many businesses um, and multifamilies recycle. Um, some certainly do, but we don't um, feel that we have the data to really start um, advertising a number for total diversion in the city. Um, that's something we hope to have, though, moving forward into the future. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the future of some of the programs. Um, when rates were set and a voluntary program um, started in um, 2017, our consultant told us we, there was a lot of debate about whether we do opt-in or opt-out. Um, our consultant told us that pretty much any approach we took eventually would converge with about 25% participation, um, that that was what they had seen um, in, in study sites across the U.S. And I think particularly they looked at some locations up in the um, Pacific Northwest area. Um, we are now getting close to 22%. I noticed um, the numbers this month. Um, I expect um, that that will continue to slow down and will probably converge with about 25%. If that is going to change, it will probably take, um, and, and we certainly have uh, spent a, a time in a couple different efforts to promote it. They gave little bumps um, both times. Uh, so they did help and they helped with the awareness, um, but over time, much like we saw with our recycling program, um, there was a really a um, lower, not a, as high a return on the investment and the outreach for the program. Now that's not to say it's not important. It is very important still, but what I'm saying is that other efforts will need to be taken if we expect that to increase. Those efforts could include charging more for trash, so um, more aggressive pays you throw rates. Um, it's also likely that if you included uh, the fee in the subscription, much like we do with recycle, that eventually um, many more residents would use it. Most people like to use things they pay for, particularly when they get a cart for it. Um, so those are a couple options for how the, the needle could move on that program. Um, also multifamily composting is um, you know, an untapped um, opportunity still in Longmont. I will say um, Longmont Sanitation, our program, can only serve uh, multifamilies up to eight units. Um, most of these are larger uh, complexes that would be served by private haulers. So um, some of the problems we do see out there is a lot of them don't have good landings and facilities. Even uh, for the ones we provide recycle at, sometimes we have a lot of challenges getting um, to the to the dumpsters or the carts, and um, and that's something that would have to be addressed over time. Next slide, please. Future of recycle. Um, certainly, we'd like to um, enhance curbside diversion. Uh, we think there's a lot more opportunity there. Um, we have spent a lot of effort on outreach education on that topic. Um, we found really after the single stream program was launched in 2010, um, it was around 2015, 2016, it really 
participation or the um, amounts that were recycled really tended to flatten out. So um, if we're going to move the needle there, um, probably need to continue with outreach and education. That's certainly going to be very important. Um, but um, it's possible that we would need, once again, even more aggressive pay-as-you-throw rates um, to incentivize that. Um, we don't know, that, as I mentioned earlier, the commercial levels, um, but that, that is also an untapped potential. Um, it's likely that a future um, for solid waste in all of Colorado um, you know, will become, and, and the U.S. You know, in general, will become, um, instead of the current weekly trash and every other week recycle and compost, and every other week trash and weekly recycle and compost, um, that would be a real good measure of success in the future. Um, there were comments tonight, and we have heard a lot from uh, residents to provide multiple bins for recycle. Um, we would like to um, address that with the next code revisions. Um, we think there's a way to do that. There probably possibly could be a little bit of a fee for that. That would be up to council. Um, what I do know, though, is that if we just open it up and offer a second bin, um, we do have concerns. Those bins are expensive and they're expensive to maintain. We have concerns that they just get requested and used for other things or not used at all. And, um, you know, to, to equip the, the whole community with um, an, a 96 gallon cart is, you know, in the millions of dollars range. Um, it's above a million dollars. It's very expensive. So we would have to deal with that in rates or cost recovery um, somehow. There are many ways that could be done, however. Next slide, please. Uh, future rates and pay as you throw. Um, we are currently funded for, for um, the programs that, that we deliver today. Um, with some growth in the community, um, we would, we're at a point now where we need to add an employee. Um, that's something we intend on doing um, the first of the year. That would be just to address uh, some of the growth in the community. We have not added employees uh, to our solid waste program for it's been uh, 10 or more years other than the employees that we added um, the, for the composting program and the equipment we added. But we've been uh, very stable, but we're getting to a point now where we're uh, going to overwhelm our, our, um, you know, our FTEs and our equipment if we take on new programs or we get uh, much more growth. Um, which I don't really expect, but um, I do think that if we expand programs, we certainly would need to add, um, add equipment and employees. Um, certainly, modifications could be made to stimulate recycling and, and composting, and, um, and that's something we can talk about um, or we can research at your direction. Um, the waste management fee can be changed. Um, we that hasn't, it's fairly low um, for the region. It's um, charged only to residences. Um, certainly it could be increased or it could be expanded beyond just uh, residential participation um, if there was a desire to do that. Um, and that fee, um, once again, can be used uh, for sustainability programs, outreach education, community programs, things that aren't provided by private haulers or the private sector. Next slide, please. Uh, Future of the Waste Diversion Center. This, this one's a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, it's been a great, reliable facility for a long time, and it continues to provide uh, good service to the community. It is, however, outdated. Um, it, it needs some types of updating. Um, there are programs that we did. You heard it tonight. We used to um, operate out of um, this facility and the public works facility out on Airport Road. Um, those certainly were programs that were popular, particularly when uh, city population was a fair amount lower. They were started um, when the city was much smaller. Um, unfortunately, they um, began to overwhelm our facilities and our resources. And now to make that next change, if we're to have um, more uh, options for hard to recycle, or uh, you know, large items that would even go to the trash, we would really have to take a quantum step up in the facilities and the staffing to do that. Um, we think that 
uh, possibly collaboration with the county is a better option and maybe some of the options that would be more um, conveniently located to Longmont. We are currently um, you know, in, in, in discussions and some level of collaboration with the county on that. They're looking at a facility we know um, in, in the county that's a little closer to Longmont that might help. Um, even just um, a different facility to get rid of green waste could open up some options. It could allow us to expand the current facility or maybe move to another similarly sized facility and really just focus on um, you know, solid items that aren't, aren't the green waste items. But um, we think that there is probably more conversation and collaboration discussion to be had there um, before we start looking at updating our current site. And for that reason, we've held back about 1.5 million that we had earmarked for updates to that facility, um, not wanting to spend the money in a way that really would not be that helpful to the community. Um, the Charm Facility in Boulder does um, offer options. Um, it is a bit of a drive from from Longmont. Um, it's not horrible, but it, it does provide good options for hard to recycle um, items. Um, that's operated by EcoCycle. Um, there are a lot of local private options. We put that in the packet. Um, a lot of companies that provide options for many hard to recycle items. Uh, we have not advertised those on our website. Um, it's a little dicey when you start advertising or showing you know, private companies you know, more because it can change quickly or they can come and go. But that is certainly something we could look at in the future that might be helpful to residents. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some items just so you know that we do not accept um, at Longmont. Um, electronics, you know, large furniture and mattresses, um, porcelain items, fire extinguishers, um, books are things, you know, textiles we don't recycle. Obviously, um, we don't have facilities for construction and demolition debris, and um, we don't have local facilities for household, um, you know, chemicals or hazardous materials. We do have events in Longmont for those, and then there is a facility um, in Boulder that um, our residents can participate in or take materials to. Next slide, please. Future of outreach and education, um, it's very important that we, you know, maintain current levels of, of recycle and composting. We don't want to lose ground there. Um, so we do need to keep those programs rolling, um, you know, to, to at least keep that. And anytime there's a program change that might affect those programs, that we, we jump on that with good outreach and good education. Um, Preventing contamination, you know, in, in recycle bins and compost bins are important. Um, community messaging, um, you know, enhancing sustainability efforts and regional efforts are important. Um, improving online outreach is something we'd like to see more of in the future. Um, the our outreach with St. Rain Valley School District, um, you heard some comments about EcoCycle's Green Star program, and we contribute to that. There's certainly more, um, you can always contribute more to any of these uh, programs and, and efforts. Um, and so um, they're important and we intend to continue um, to do that. I know EcoCycle has offered and continues to offer to collaborate on outreach and education. We have done that. Um, uh, there's certainly some opportunities for that moving into the future as well. Next slide, please. So other, other means to increase waste aversion, these kind of circle back to some of the comments you heard from the community tonight. Um, a universal uh, recycling ordinance could certainly target, um, you know, in, in addition to residential, uh, the commercial, um, multifamily and, and uh, construction demolition uh, types of wastes. Um, plastic bag ordinance is always something that could be considered. Um, I think the future will probably look more at producer responsibilities to recycle products. That's probably, you know, more regional and state efforts um, to do things like that. But um, as I mentioned in the white paper, um, waste reduction is going to be also part of the, the equation. It can't just be recycling. We need to find ways to generate uh, less waste and to um, reduce the production of virgin products that, you know, cause a lot of, you know, that 
fuel a lot of oil production or mining industries. Um, not that we have anything against any of those industries. Um, it's that the environmental impacts that we all recognize that we need to at some level um, contain. So there are some opportunities here and, um, and certainly some good local ones um, that we could consider and like to discuss tonight. Next slide, please. Excuse me, Bob. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to move that we extend the meeting past 11 o'clock. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, motion passes unanimously. So um, I'm really at the point of discussion now, and I, my last last comments to you are that um, you know th this would be a kind of a roadmap for what what could occur, um, depending on what you'd like to direct us to do. Um, if you do, um, it would probably begin with a look at our uh, municipal code, and um, and certainly um, how that could change to do things that might stimulate additional waste diversion in the community. Um, once again, not advocating, but that um, those are options that you have. And I think that taking that to the next level will probably require um, some code revisions. Um, that could include, you know, a universal uh, recycling ordinance, um, other things that might drive that. If, for example, council were to direct us to uh, study the possibilities of that type of an ordinance, we, we do that once um, we got beyond that stage, um, that would then trigger a lot of actions that would have to be phased in. For example, if, if the city ever adopted something like a universal recycling ordinance, that then would um, require us to provide composting to all residents and that would take us some phase in time to do that. Obviously businesses, um, multifamilies, um, all these other entities out there would be in the same position of needing some uh, phase in considerations to be able to, um, you know, in, enrich the, um, the goals overall. So um, this is how I would see something uh, occurring is we probably start with the look at the code, then move f um, through um, what actions that would trigger in planning and analysis, um, you know, if that would have any rate impacts at all. And then um, obviously the implementation phase uh, would be something that would be phased in. Um, with regards to the hard to recycle items, there are certainly um, different options or different discussions we can have. Um, I do think that we're in a good position right now with our discussions with the county. And I'd really like to continue with those um, as we talk about where we move in the future or possibly before we start expanding our current facilities, but um, you know, those are options for your consideration. Next slide, please. So here we are. Let's start with look like Hollywood Squares. Let's go with uh, Councilmember Dago Faring. So um, I have a question about the EcoCycle partnership because at one time the city worked a lot with EcoCycle and not so much anymore. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so can you give me a little bit of history and context for that? Sure. Um, Mayor and members of city council. Um, yes, the city actually continues to work with EcoCycle. They're a service provider to us. Mm -hmm. They haul uh, much of our recycling material from the Waste Diversion Center. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with them even in the composting program on our outreach and education. We did um, also work with a, another private entity in that. That was the first time that we hadn't either produced the materials ourselves or worked with EcoCycle in producing um, mixed results, but um, but it it did um, it was a good exploration for us and a good learning experience to see also the impacts of working um, you know with a marketing firm on trying to really bump that composting program. But mm -hmm. I think we have a good relationship with EcoCycle and continue to work with them. Okay. 
okay, good. Um, so in the future, are you are is the city planning on you know kind of building that 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 partnership? So they they are playing a a stronger role, especially as we look to um, recycle you know more recycling and composting. Um, and as far as community outreach as well, Mayor and Council, we. Um... We certainly will um, keep in mind they are a service provider. They're they're not an organization that we can you know enter an, into an IGA with. So um, as we look at ways that we also have to work competitively through our um, purchasing code, our procurement codes, um, we certainly have a lot of options. But there are some certainly some restrictions on us just opening it up to partnering if it is a fee based uh, partnership. Okay, and then as far as, so, and the reason why I'm kind of pinpointing EcoCycle is the school I teach at is a Green Star school, and we've worked really closely with uh, EcoCycle. They've come in and done pre have done presentations and um, just worked with the students in getting them to understand, you know, the whole component of composting, where even we have our little kinders, you know, our little ones who are separating out you know, the, what goes in compost, what goes in recycling, what goes in trash, and they, you know, they, they had a system going. So, you know, I think that there is a lot of value in you, uh, tapping into their expertise with um, community outreach and education. So, you know, I want to make sure that, that, I mean, I think for me, there might be others, you know, that you would know more than me, but I kind of honed in on EcoCycle because, you know, just my own experience with them as an educator in St. Brain. Mayor and council, yes, they do an excellent job with that program and other programs, and, and we do provide funding for that program. Okay. Certainly, um, I don't, can't think of any reason why we won't continue doing that. Okay, and um, you know, I guess I'll let everybody, you know, I wanted to kind of look, I wanted to offer my um, input as far as directing staff, but I guess I'll let other people chime in uh, first. Let's go with Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Badley. Uh, Bob, there are a couple of things that you mentioned that were a little bit troublesome to me. And one of them was the hard to recycle uh, items that we did twice a year, is that correct? Um, and we stopped it because we had too many participants. Um, it seems like if we start getting more people, then we should think about enlarging our uh, our project rather than stopping it. I mean, we want people to participate. So sending everybody to uh, Boulder, um, I'm not sure that's the way Longmont should go. We should, I, I would like you and staff to work to enlarge that somehow and, and not stop a program that's working. Um, and also, uh, when we're talking about, you know, it was just mentioned in our last conversation about the annexation that developers are building horizontal now as we look at more dense urbanization. So having these multifamily uh, buildings, residences uh, go up, we need to look at a vision as to how are we going to actually make them uh, available to recycle and compost rather than uh, not. I, I, in other words, I think that we should be thinking more of the future and how to continue our programs and just say, this is getting too big or too bulky for us. We're just gonna quit doing it. Um, doesn't, I don't know, that just doesn't sound right to me at all. Um, the other thing is that when you're talking about smaller bins for composting, can we not just take some of those uh, pay-as-you-throw bins? I mean, we, I know we'd have to purchase more, but put green lids on those, uh, the smaller bins, the 48 container ones. Those are just some of my suggestions. I actually would like universal composting and I would like universal uh, recycling. And I know it's not something we're going to be able to do tomorrow or whatever, but let, let's look at our budget and what it's going to cost and, and work toward that sooner than later. So those are my... Thank you. Mayor and Council, I would like to take a moment and 
address um, some of council member Peck's uh, comments about hard to recycle. Um, we understand, and, and we've heard that um, numerous times. Let me also describe how that program was, was once run. The, we have, you know, 22 employees who are in the operations group who actually do all the um, collection in the program. And those employees came in on the weekends to do that. And they were actually loading materials from cars and then loading them off onto a site that really wasn't large enough to uh, receive those items without them being removed quickly. Mm -hmm. So that was how we kept our rates low and dealt with the problems we have with building a facility that would require the equipment and the staffing that would not allow us cost recovery beyond Longmont residents. That's where it becomes really a challenge for us and why uh, regional solutions are without a doubt better. However, we are more than happy to investigate what it would take to do that, but it just, it would have to be done safely and with the correct equipment. We couldn't go back to doing what we did before, which is having, in fact, if you go to the charm facility today, you would see that you don't, get any real help unloading you have to do that yourself right and you, you dispose of your material and that's not how it worked in Longmont we were unloading mattresses and furniture and doing you know a lot of large items and it really wasn't healthy for our workers to be doing that um, so it would take a complete rethinking of that facility and I, I dare say uh, considerable expense to do that that would have to be returned back in the form of rates but it's certainly something we could look at. Um, uh, well, continuing on that subject is not, uh, correct me if, my, if I'm wrong, but didn't EcoCycle help run that program? They did. And is there a reason why we can't continue that with EcoCycle? I, that I don't know. I don't know that they have the um, equipment or the employees themselves to do, you know, the unloading of equipment as we once did. Um, it does take traffic control um, to do it at the sites we have now, so we'd have to um, deal with uh, transportation differently. But yes, they did help with those programs. So wouldn't uh, it would be worth checking in with them again to see how we can perhaps use several sites, different sites, different days, more than uh, twice a year to, to make it more palatable. Um, so that would be my direction is to, let's see how we can continue or, or re-engage with the EcoCycle or perhaps another uh, recycling company to do that. So. All right, let's go with Councilmember Martin. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, Bob, is, is there a cost associated with, um, to, a cost to the city associated with the wrong stuff being in the wrong bin? Um, be, and let me answer that first and then I'll tell you where I'm going. Mayor and Council, I'm gonna turn that uh, question over to Charlie Caminides. Thank you, thank you, Bob, and uh, Mayor Bagley and Councilmember Martin. That, that's a real good question. And I think ultimately there is a cost to it um, in the sense of where we currently take our, I assume you're talking about recycling materials, or even our compost. When those MRFs or those processing facilities have a lot more contamination to deal with, the value of the product or the cost of us managing it goes up. So having, better cleaner materials are better for the processing and the cleaning and all of that. We're fortunate to work with Boulder County with our MRF and, and uh, the outreach and education that we have out there is, is, is good. And the you know, typical contamination overall at Boulder County is within some standards, but go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have a, a singular problem uh, that may be unique to my block, uh, maybe it's unique to my house, but I kind of suspect not, which is that passersby have a tendency to um, dump their trash in, in bins that are on the curb. And uh, when they do that, they don't usually pick the right bin. Um, they just 
do it in you know whatever whatever one is uh, closest to them or whatever. Um, and I am wondering, you know, people don't people are really good at not tampering with your mailbox. Um, and we have a lot more families now that have installed uh, ring cameras and things like that that might make uh, this particular sort of vandalism detectable and reportable. Um, so could you give your opinion on what an ordinance that makes it uh, a, a, an infraction of some sort, appropriate infraction, um, a code violation to put your trash in somebody else's bin while it's sitting on the curb. Mayor, council, uh, that's a good question. I would have to research that. Yes, I don't know that I've ever seen that ordinance. So same here. Yeah. Well, that ordinance doesn't exist now, but I'd sh I would sure like to have you consider it because. Um, it's, it's an annoyance to me to, you know, when I'm bringing my bins back to have to inspect them to see if there's something that doesn't belong there. And uh, uh, as, as Charlie said, I think it probably uh, costs the city money by reducing the quality of, of the recycling streams in particular. <coughs> so uh, yeah, that's, that's my input. That's for Christensen. So I, Thank you, Bob. I think this is a really great presentation. I can't believe how excited I am about solid waste. But <laughs> um, so there's a, I have a lot of things to discuss. There are, um, there's a little bit of a discrepancy between what the S, uh, SRL group thinks is universal composting and what you think is universal composting. And I'm going to go maybe with you but um so i i would i would like to see all those things happen i would like to see us go from i wouldn't like to see any mandates exactly i would like to see us go from an opt out to an opt in system for composting i think that would give us some uh added stuff we when we had the you know, I'm the person who brought the composting forth in 2000, early oh, 2000. Right. Did you mean switch it from, everyone's going like this. Did you mean you want to go from an opt-in to an opt-out? Yes, you're right. Okay. I'm tired. So am I. Uh, I know. Um, when we had the consultant come and she did a very good job of anal analyzing different things. I was very disappointed to hear that she said that the top amount we could get probably was gonna sift out to 25%. And that no matter what we did, um, that's what we would have. And that we would have better uh, people taking it, if better taking, um, if we did an opt in. But you know, the way, you gain efficiency is to have more people in. And so um, I, I really do think that these programs need to have a sort of proof of concept. We've got proof of concept for a couple of years, but I really think if we had an opt out with a lot of education, we could get more people in. Um, and I do think that it would be a very good idea to see, I know Charlie uh, Kamenides has been working on trying to get uh, commercial, you know, apartment buildings involved in this, because that would, if we can get commercial, a commercial requirement um, that everybody needs to at least recycle, that would be huge because that, as you say, that's 50% of the waste that we have. Um, and if we could get uh, apartments, even if they're just the smaller ones like eight, that would be a huge amount of stuff, I think, too, to add to this. But as you say, it's a balance between having the staff and the equipment to do this 
and not wanting to raise the rates too much. But if we involved more commercial stuff in it, then that would help pay for it. That's what my feeling is. And then the third uh, thing is, of course, um, well, what Randy Mormon, who's from EcoCycle, suggested is requiring contractors to pay a fee for waste. I think that's very interesting. I've been trying to get rid of um, household waste from various projects, you know. It, you can't get rid of wood that's little chunks and stuff. You have to throw it out. This is ridiculous. And if we could s resolve the problem of contractor waste and home waste of various people's various little crazy remodeling projects like mine, um, we're just fixing up repair jobs. Um, that would be a huge thing. Right now, you just have to throw out small scraps of wood, um, half sheets of plywood. Nobody wants this stuff because it's, it's difficult to make use of, but it is a huge amount of waste in this town. Um, I also am very glad that you're doing stuff with the school system. I think that I am very big on shaming and nagging because it's the only way to get things done sometimes. I'm a mother, so you know, if you if you've got little kids nagging you to do, you know, nagging, uh, which is what I did to my parents, nagging them to fix up things that were fire traps, nagging them to not throw stuff out that's wasteful, nagging them. <laughs> um, it works. It works on adults. And the future is kids who get this, who understand this. The other thing is that I, I, I really think we need to do a massive education program on why really we're recycling and composting. It's not to feel good about ourselves. It's because we have, we really have a climate emergency and there's only so much you can do with not having more emissions. It's good, if we, ha if we can cut emissions, that'll be great. But we still have the problem of so much carbon dioxide that we're heating everything up. And the only way to turn that around is what's called drawdown. You have to do carbon sequestration. Composting is how you do that and better land use. The more land we cover up with buildings, the less carbon sequestration we have. We're never gonna get on top of anything unless we do some drawdown. And that has to do with regenerative agricultural and the circular economy and carbon sequestration and recycling things and composting things are the core of that. Um, so I would like us to really think about educating people. I, for instance, my neighbor, who's a nice guy, throws out a lot of bottles. That's mostly what is in his um, recycling bin. But I, I, came, I went out the other night at two in the morning, which is when I usually recycle stuff. I'm in my alley and I opened the wrong bin. I opened his bin and his recycling bin is full of leaves. This guy is intelligent. He doesn't seem to grasp that you cannot recycle leaves. <laughs> they belong in the compost. He doesn't have a compost bin. I've told him he could put it in my compost bin. Anyway, so we need to educate the adults as well as the children about why this is important, and firstly, and secondly, what they can and cannot compost and how to keep it from being, and, and what they can recycle. Don't put your yogurt containers in there without rinsing them. Don't put your beer bottles in there without rinsing them. Don't put wet stuff in there with your paper because it contaminates everything. I don't think most people understand how much is wasted in recycling by, uh, by um, contamination. Anyway, I'll shut up. But I do think I, I, I certainly uh, support the three things that you were talking about with the universal recycling or universal universal composting. composting and recycling. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Mayor Pro Tem. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I would like to boil it down real quick to this one item in the sense that this concept is very large and we're discussing a lot of things without being making any sort of decisions. And I think there's way too many items here to, for us to start willy-nilly making motions at 11.20 p.m. So I really would like kind of more of a concrete list from staff that we can go down one by one and make adjustment motions or yay or, yay or nay votes on, uh, because this is just a circular conversation at this point, because I absolutely 100% agree that these are things that we need to move forward, how we get there and what's most easily attainable, uh, as well as what's the furthest from being attainable. I mean, we need some of those, we need, we need money numbers as far as the costs for these things, as far as rates are concerned, if we go through with things. So I would really like maybe some of these things boiled down to universal composting for our residents uh, that we can currently service based off state law. Um, so how we, you know, for those people that are currently serviced by the city of Longmont versus private haulers. Then we can, and separately look at commercial and multifamily as well. I think lumping all these into one thing tonight after 11 o'clock, we're not going to probably be able to come to any sort of consensus or decision at this point because there's just too many details to, to, to suss through. Uh, for instance, one of mine being is phasing and implementation and economic costs because we know that we're in a precarious position for both residents and businesses right now economically and start issuing mandates at 11.20 p.m. for waste services I don't think is wise. Um, so I would like staff to come back. Like, I think I would, I would like to make a motion that staff bring back in um, appropriate pieces actionable items because I think everyone on city council, and we'll find out, if there's a second or, or a vote. Uh, but I think city council is interested in moving forward with these items. But right now, I just don't think we're going to get anywhere by just discussing our our wants versus our needs and, and what we're able to service. I'll second that. Second. Would, you, would you take it a friendly amendment? Absolutely. Well, I would, I would ask you suggest, I would like a list going from lowest hanging fruit to hardest along with the specific costs um, in terms of budget money and rate increases. And then we can discuss what things we should attack and do. Because in a perfect world, we do it all. But can we afford it? Who do we pass on the cost to? And again, the problem I'm always faced with is uh, Council Member Peck once said, we're doing the people's work. We'll stay as long as possible. I'm willing. My brain, however, is not capable. Yeah. So uh, at this point, I'd probably vote for anything and not understand what I was voting for. But uh, would you accept that amendment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Bagley. It's a big pie and we need to take it piece by piece. I right. accept. There's a, there's a motion on the floor, Council Member Hidalgo Ferry. Um, something I, you know, I wanna bring up too, it, the level of urgency as well. Um, you know, this has been on the docket since pre-COVID and it keeps kind of getting pushed down the line. So when it comes back to, you know, council, I want, I would like to see it come back in a, in a, in a quick return. Cause I, I'm, I mean, I'm ready to like, let's, we got to write an ordinance on universal composting and, you know, let's get this, let's get this moving. If we're really serious about um, zero waste and, um, you know, and taking care of our environment. So no, I, I, I will, I will support this, but if we can kind of, you know, and, make and this a little more pressing. And I, I would agree with you. I would agree with you. And I know that the P, I know that SRL and many of our, our allies and, and people we respect in the community, I think we've been waiting since March was what was said by, mm -hmm. by Sherry. Um, my only concern, I would agree and echo and Harold, I would ask that we put it on the agenda as soon as possible with the understanding that we're in a pandemic and we understand that you guys are exhausted and we give you guys things all the time to do and it's hard and all that stuff. So, um, you know, so put it on immediately, but with a grain of salt that says, uh, do what you gotta do with the other things that you're doing to keep us safe. Um, Council Mayor Peck. Um, I would like to actually make that a little tighter in that, uh, Dale, is there, 
possible to bring something back to us in January? You're, you're muted. Uh, Council Member Peck and, and Mayor Bagley, uh, just a couple of thoughts. We can bring it back it, it really as quickly as we can move through some of these things. And if we come back with smaller slices of the pie, we can bring back things sooner. Um, I, you know, we can make our first cut at what we believe, listening to what the mayor's motion was, you know, the lower hanging fruit. We can do some of that. I, I would recommend though, that we do some level of analysis so that when we return to you, it's not just this blank slate. In other words, there's a sense of, of um, the economic side of it. There's a sense of the gain and the benefit, the environmental benefit of what we're trying to achieve. That does take some work and analysis to do that well, uh, so that we're, we're providing you with you know, solid information. Um, I see Becky chimed in. She's probably gonna be doing a lot of this data analysis for us, but um, I, I know we, can, we got the talent to do the work, whether we have enough horses to get everything done as quickly as we can is probably another, another question. But again, if we come back with a smaller slice of the thing, I, I think we can do it. But. I guess what I uh, would like to avoid is that in March, it'll be a year that we extend this out to where- Agreed. Right. Yeah, so if we could get something, hopefully by that year date or before, that would be great. And, and I agree with you, Dale, the, the smaller slices of pie and, and uh, Mayor Bagley, that's a good idea. So thank you. And my, my, my only, what, what literally is what's going through my head is, is uh, rather than give a deadline, my fear is that we're gonna be dealing at Christmas time with a pandemic that we, we are, we are going, we're gonna be, it's gonna be bad. And so my fear is that we start focusing on things that I'd like to see us get through the first of the year. Uh, not, not because I'm pushing this off, but I have a feeling that staff is gonna be really busy in about 14 days. So um, I saw some hands up. Bob, you wanna say something? Yeah, um, Mayor and Council, I, I, I wanna echo what Dale said and, and maybe make this a little easier. Um, we haven't done a comprehensive review or started this type of discussion for quite a few years. We talked last about composting and pay as you throw rates, but I would suggest that rather than trying to just bite and, and get the whole universe of, of way services figured out that we start with the few things that are going to have the greatest impact. Those are going to be things that we do at the curbside and the possibility of expanding recycling to beyond uh, just residences in the community, i.e. probably looking at different alternatives for a universal recycling ordinance. I, those are going to be, that is by far going to be the single biggest thing of everything in those lists that we could do. And if you had us focus on spending some time looking at alternatives for how that could be written, then the analysis comes along with that. And we can continue to come back year after year instead of waiting so many years and bring other pieces into the program. But without a doubt, there are going to be two or three really large things that we can do. I think more with education outreach, a universal re uh, recycling ordinance, um, exploring these hard to recycle options um, that are uh, more convenient for the, the community. Those three by far will be the big three. So Aaron, it's your motion, but it kind of sounds like he already jumped ahead and gave us the answer, which is <laughs> let's start with these things. And so sure, and as he also mentioned, the, that curbside is a big thing. I think that uh, talking about uh, either universal or opt-out composting becomes easily in that, that conversation as well, because it is a, a curbside controllable issue for the city uh, one way or another, as far as that's concerned. Um, my concern, yes, is now with the timing of it, but I would rather see good work done than hasty work. So, what's your? Do you want to restate your motion for us, Aaron? So, I believe my motion was for city staff to bring back the larger conversation in pieces that are actionable. Uh, I will. I will second that. So, do we have any? I know that you want to say something, Susie, but can you wait till after the motion? Does it have to do with the motion? 
Can I, I can I first just say that I think I jumped the gun a little bit, and I believe that Councilmember Hidalgo Faring was going to make a motion, and I just happened to get called on first. All so. right, Susie, so, what you want to say? Um, well, you know what? So some of the things that I was listing listing and what people were calling for are part of that larger. So it could be maybe pushed down to for um, give staff time to get a deeper analysis on it. But something that it sounds like you know, it could be that low hanging fruit piece is putting together an ordinance for universal curbside composting collection and recycling. So I mean, I like that idea of universal. Let's take a more aggressive approach than just even that opt out option. But it's kind of like, this is all part of the system. If, and I'll, you know, I'll defer to Bob, if you feel like this is something that is doable at this time, I would like to, to make a motion to get an ordinance drafted at least on that piece and then have, um, you know, with deeper analysis on some of those, those other larger components like the recycling and um, in multifamily units and, and all that. So, well, and I think uh, mayor and council that would all start to feed into that concept of a universal ordinance. Mm -hmm. That ordinance, what that would allow us to do is deal with the concept of what we want to achieve and then start looking at the economic impacts of that. But that would be, if you want staff to do its best work, that would be a really good focus area to start with. But that's not to say we didn't hear a lot of other things tonight that we yeah. can be working on, many that are a little bit below this radar of, of necessarily um, needing direction right away to do things. Mm -hmm. um, there are, and we are working a lot of those, but that would be one that we could really, um, and, and there are many different ways to do that ordinance. Mm -hmm. So we so, would, what I would envision would be bringing back options of what it could look like or alternatives and then getting more direction and dialogue and using that as kind of the center focal point for where we go. If you decided not to adopt an ordinance of that nature, you're still going to have the right conversations about what you want from recycling in commercial, mm -hmm. uh, multifamily, and expanding the residential if that's what you wanna do. So even if you didn't adopt it, it would not be wasted time. Okay, so and also adding a piece in there where we have those zero waste practices for city-sponsored events, for when we permit, um, give permits for use of public spaces, to have those, those things. So it's kind of embedded in our everyday behaviors. So, so, so hold on, I'm gonna cut everybody out. So, Right now, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna point out we have consensus that in an ideal world, Longmont would, everyone would compost, we'd all have residential cycling, recycling, we'd all have commercial recycling, and we would be a zero waste city. The motion on the floor is for city staff to bring back some low hanging fruit, some easy right now targets that, that they're gonna put it in terms of dollars so they can start immediately and then bring us back pieces as soon as they can in order to push us towards that goal. Is anyone against what I just said? All right, so let's go ahead and vote on the motion and then get started on, on making our, our city cleaner and, and, and uh, closer to zero waste. All right, so all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Bob, find some low hanging, really good impactful stuff bring it back with some costs and let's get going. All right? All right. Okay, let's move on to, uh, I move that we recess as the Longmont City Council and convene as the Board of Commissioners of the Longmont Housing Authority. No, 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 that got moved to the fifth too. Oh, did it? So that's yeah. it then? That's yeah. it for general business? Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Nice. All right, let's move on then. Let's take a three minute break and move on to final call, public invited to be heard, okay? Be right back. All right, folks, this is the final public invited to be heard for the evening. Please once again, dial the uh, number on your screen, enter the meeting ID and mute the live stream when you do call in and listen to the instructions that happen on your telephone.
All right, that might have been two minutes, but I'm guessing there's nobody in the line, right? That is correct, Mayor. Uh, I was just guessing. Midnight's kind of <laughs> late to say something. All right, so let's go ahead and close the final call public invited to be heard. And let's move on to Mayor and Council comments. Who would like to say some really brilliant things? Marsha? Marsha always wants to say brilliant things. Is Marsha back? Let's yes. I'm right. back. My uh, uh, never mind. I couldn't. Um, I couldn't become visible for a minute there. That, that, that's all right. I would just like to, you know, read into the record for people who are watching the next day that today was Giving Tuesday, and usually, um, you know, you've got in your email and you know on your Facebook page and all that stuff, um, some messages about Giving Tuesday that you didn't quite get to. And um, I just wanna tell everybody that they're willing to take your money tomorrow. So if you missed Giving Tuesday, don't miss Giving Tuesday. All right, I, and I, I just wanna I just want to say that uh, we all joke that 2020 has been a hell of a year. And uh, I just keep interacting with clients and friends and colleagues and. The, 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 the level of anxiety continues to be just off the charts and every, everything's going to be fine. So I don't know anybody's watching. They're probably all asleep, but life's good. We'll be fine. We'll figure it out. All right. So let's go ahead. Harold, do you got anything to say? No comments, Mayor Council. Eugene? No comments from here, Mayor. All right. Can we have a motion to adjourn, please? Move to adjourn. I'll second that, Joan. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. say nay. Good night. All right. Motion carries unanimously. Good night, guys. Talk to you later.